We open this meeting at uh, 6 34. Uh, I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of, of the United States, States of America. America. And, and to, to the, the republic, republic for, for which it stands, stands one, one nation, nation under, under God, God indivisible, liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. Thank you. Uh, Secretary Petronella will not be participating tonight, so uh, Second Vice Chair Linda DeGray will assume the role. Secretary, should please call the roll. Lou Fiore. Here. Linda DeGray. Here. Virginia Higley. Here. John Petronella is absent. Nick Lefakis. Here. Uh, Frank Alimo. Here. Vinny Grillo. Here. Ken Holinsky. Here. Karam Mudjnu. Maj Mudjnu. Thank you. You're welcome. He's <laughs> absent. He's absent. Tonight. And Christian D. Antonio. Here. Okay. Thank you. Take a motion to accept the minutes of April 14th. So moved. Is there any? Dis is there a second? Second. It's a motion made by Vice Chairman Higley, seconded by Commissioner Holinsky, to accept the minutes from April 14th. Is there any discussion on the minutes? Mm -hmm. Any changes to the minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor of the minutes, let the records show that uh, five, uh, excuse me, six are four and two abstain. Uh, Commissioner D'Antonio and Grillo abstain because they did not participate in that meeting. Is there any public participation for Enfield Aquifer Protection? Seeing none, is there any correspondence for Enfield Aquifer Protection? Any correspondence, Georgie, from your standpoint? Um, not at the moment, um, but I do have two other applications for aquifer protection that we received. However, I just want to want to reflect that they are not yet complete. So I'm hoping before July they'll be on the July agenda. Is for two auto businesses similar near State Line Auto, for Marks Motorsports and Meineke Car Care Center. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And the Meineke, that's the one on uh, Freshwater, correct, over by Cranbrook? Meineke is by Costco. 66 Enfield, up the street. Oh, the other one, the other Meineke. Yep. Okay. Oh, there are two. Okay. Thank you very much. Seeing that, I believe this is the application for uh, ARA 2288 Enfield Street. Yes, that's me. Aquifer registration application over the A43 Aquifer for State Line Auto. Uh, Seth Kloss, did I pronounce yeah, that correctly? Seth Clace. Clace, I'm sorry. Applicant Robert Sylvia Nuger. Family owners, map 35, lot 43, BG zone. If the applicant order is here, please sit down and <clears throat> excuse me, identify yourself for the record. Just make sure the mic is on, the red button, and pull that close to you, please. Looks good. This is uh, Seth Clace. How are you? Good. How are you? All right. And you're here representing 88 Enfield Street? I am. Thank you. Um, and maybe you can kind of lead us along, Georgie, please. Good evening. Um, so just some background. I'm just gonna read my staff report into the record because it contains all the information, hopefully answers any questions you may have. And we haven't had an APA meeting in a while, so this might be a little refresher for you. Um, so as we know, the site is home to State Line Auto and Trucking Business located over the A43 Aquifer. The site is eligible for registration again because the site had an original renewal of APA from the Nogger family in May of 2010. Um, similar to other applicants, Nogger family was never notified about their registration and their expiration. Um, so that grants them a forgiveness period and then add on top of that the forgiveness period we have right now from the state so that grants him eligibility to continue to register. Um, the Nogger family originally had the site registered under multiple activities A, B, C, D, E, G, V, and X all about hazardous materials, de-icing materials, car and truck washing. Um, so now the applicant comes before us today with much much difference in activities. So he only has D, which is repair or maintenance of vehicles or internal combustion engines of vehicles. Um, additional information in relation to this activity includes the use, storage, and disposal of hazardous materials, including solvents, lubricants, paints, brake fluids, transmission fluids, or the generation of any hazardous waste. So we did a site inspection at Stateland Auto on May 13th, where staff met outside with the applicant. It was observed the materials stored in site here are organized Organized, no violations were detected, and no chemicals or waste barrels were located in any unauthorized areas of the site. Um, the facility also contained zero floor drains. There were no floor stains from any chemicals that were seen on the floor of the facility. 
Dumpsters were found to be in compliance, no holes or rusting, as well as have proper protection to prevent water access into the waste. This site was also found to be cared for by the owner in regards to facility hygiene and organization. Based off this inspection, the nature of Stateline Auto, the activity conducted at this site does meet the definition of activity B as described above according to regulations and the RCSA regulations. So the applicant submitted their best management plan and their materials management plan, which satisfy the required regulations of Section 12 of the Enfield APA regulations. Um, and it should also be noted that vehicle waste oil isn't considered a hazardous material under the hazardous waste regulations unless it is mixed with a hazardous material. The waste oil is burned on this site with the proper waste oil burner generator and a freeze isn't considered hazardous until it's been used. This applicant has 25 gallons, one barrel of hazardous waste and a freeze on site. Safety Clean is their third party company and is hired by the applicant to come properly dispose of any waste material on site. Stormwater runoff on this site runs down towards the back of the property into the businesses behind it where Marks Motorsports and Minor Key is located. These drain into the, behind, the near catch basins near Marks Motorsports, which eventually drain off into the wetlands behind it. Um, the facility does not have any potential pollution violations that are exposed to any rainwater access that would potentially pollute the groundwater area. Thank you. Thank you. If I may, as Chairman, I, I excluded one step that we should have done earlier because we have the two members that are missing tonight. I do need to mention that alternate uh, Commissioner Grillo and alternate Commissioner Lefakis, it's their turn to be the full-time members tonight for the uh, Act for Protection Agency. Thank I you. apologize for not mentioning that earlier, everybody. Is there any questions for the applicant or staff on this? I'm seeing none again. I'm just going to mention again the staff that says based on the inspection that they did in the nature of state line auto, the activity conducted at the site does meet the definition of activity D described above according to RISA section 22. So it looks like everything's in pretty good nature. I take it we need a motion to approve or accept. I make a motion to approve ARA uh, 22 88 Enfield Street Aquifer registration application over the A43 Aquifer for state line auto, Seth Klaus. Place, yeah. Place. Uh, applicant Robert and Sylvia Nugent, family owner, map 35, lot 43, BG zone. Motion made by Commissioner DeGray. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner uh, Helinski. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, will the secretary please call the roll? Take your time. I'm not used to this. Yeah, I know you're not. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Uh, Lou Fiore. Four. Linda DeGray. Four. Virginia Higley? Four. Uh, Nick Glefakis? Four. Frank Galimo? Four. Vinnie Grillo? Four. Ken Holinsky? Four. The record shows the past seven nothing. I think we're all set. Accepted your you're all set. Thank you for coming. Thank tonight. you very much. Thank you for working with staff on getting this completed. Thank you. Absolutely. And thank you, staff. Thank you. Yep, we'll be in touch. Is there any other business in the act for protection? Uh -uh. No. Seeing none, we hopefully we'll get those so we're not because we're not gonna do them in August, right? No. Okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Let's adjourn. Take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion second. made by Commissioner Higley, seconded by Commissioner DeGray to adjourn. All those in favor? Signify by saying aye. 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 The record show unanimous will adjourn. The next step will be the planning zone emission uh, meeting that will start at 7 p.m. Time is 641. Time is 641.
Call this meeting to order the Enfield Planning Zoning Commission, Thursday night, June 30th at 7.02. You please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, America and, and to, to the, the Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation, under God, with liberty and justice for all. Thank everyone. Fire evacuation announcement. Uh, fire evacuation is right behind you, the doors. So right behind you also, out these doors and then down the stairs, out the back. And please, if there is an evacuation, please move away from the building as far as away as possible. Thank you. Our secretary, John Petronello, is not here tonight, so Vice Chairman DeGray will fill in as secretary. Would you please call the roll? Lou Fiore. Here. Virginia Higley. Here. Linda DeGray. Here. John Petronello, absent. Frank Alimo. Here. Karam Mudge Mudar, absent. Ken Holinsky. Here. Vinny Grillo. Here. Christian D'Antonio. Here. And Nick Lefakis. Here. Thank you. I'll make the announcement because we have two regular members absent tonight. Commissioner Grillo and Commissioner Lefakis will be sitting in as a regular full time voting members tonight with Commissioner D'Antonio as the uh, backup. Make a motion to approve the minutes of the January 9th regular meeting. So moved. Motion made Second. by Commissioner Holinsky, seconded by Commissioner Pigley. Any discussion on the minutes? Nope. I did have two uh, corrections I believe that do need to be made, only because uh, I'm a stickler with the minutes from my past experiences and how we do go back to them for reference. Um, and I'll take my time, Lori, so you can follow with me on page three. Um, the old public hearings, when we talk about PH 3036 to 33 Palumba Drive, I think it's important that my statement in there where I asked the applicant if he understood all the conditions before we approved it, and he, and he certainly indicated that he did, but I think it's important that that statement be added into the minutes just for the record in the future in case we have any problems going forward with that. And also on page six, down the bottom of the director of planning report, towards the bottom it says, Ms. Witten stated that there will be a public meeting at the Senior Center on June 15th so everyone can see the new master plan. But I think it was so everyone could see the new proposal that we're seeing tonight, not the master plan. So it's, I think it's just a correction of master plan to Felicia Sister's proposal. Okay. Does anyone have an objection to those two um, changes, amendments that I made? There are motion to accept the minutes with the amendments that I just made, please. Move. Motion made by Commissioner Alimo. Second. Seconded by Commissioner DeGray to accept the minutes with the changes that I just indicated. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Seeing aye. Uh, make a notion that um, all in favor. Com Commissioner D'Antonio did abstain because he was not at the last meeting. Town attorney report. Oh, excuse me. Well, I, Wish someone would entertain a motion that we move item 12D, <clears throat> the uh, former mall area traffic impact study by CROG, to be up in our agenda to uh, in the spot where we have bond releases. So moved. Motion made by Commissioner Higley, seconded by Second. Commissioner DeGray to move item 12D, mall area traffic impact study by CROG, to be in the spot in our agenda where we have bond releases. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Show that the record show is unanimous. We did receive our town attorney report. <clears throat> I think hopefully we had a chance to, to see that. I'm sure we'll get some other updates coming up soon on that. Now we're now we're to the part of the normal public presentation participation. Excuse me. At this point in the meeting, the Planning and Zoning Commission welcomes comments, concerns, and opinions related to planning and zoning in Enfield from anyone who is present, provided that no one may discuss any matter of business at this time that is already elsewhere on the agenda, any matter that is part of an open public hearing of the Commission, or any matter where a decision of the Commission may be pending, and that also includes any legal pending action. So is there anyone who would like to come in front of the Planning and Zoning and talk about anything that's kind of not on the agenda tonight? Is there anyone who would like to come in front of the Planning and Zoning and talk about anything not on the agenda tonight? For the last time, seeing none, public participation is closed. And now we move on to the <clears throat> item 12D, the former mall area traffic impact study by CROG. And I believe we have some representatives from CROG logging on remotely here as I speak or attempting to. 
Yeah, good, good afternoon, afternoon everyone. everyone. This, this is Kip Palmer, Palmer from Prague. Trying, trying to make sure, sure my camera, camera will turn, turn on, on for you. you. There we there go. go. Okay. okay. All right. Yes, Excuse me, also joined by Chris Henshi, a transformation fighter with Capital Region Council of Governments. Thank you both for joining us. I guess you just proceed, and I'm going to let you guys drive with Lori on this. And we're just going to sit back for now and just listen. Thank you. Yes. Thank, Thank you so, you so much, much for having, having us. us. Um, and again, yes, my name is Caitlin Palmer. I'm a planner, I'm a planner with, the with the Capital Region Council, Council of Government. Um, we are, you know, sort of the metropolitan planning organization, the planning um, organization for the 38 communities in the Hartford region. Um, and while we do many things at Prague, um, one of the things, at least on our side of the office, is we do transportation studies, corridor studies. Um, and this uh, particular project, was brought to our attention um, actually back in 2017. Um, so I'll touch on that um, and just want to thank you all so much for having us. And Chris already introduced himself and he'll be advancing my slides for me. So thank you so much, Chris. You can go ahead and we can move to the next one. Um, just real quick, this is kind of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, there's a lot of information. Um, we've been busy um, kind of the last year doing some data gathering. Um, so I will try to go over it, but be respectful of your time. I know you've got a really full agenda. Um, so just, you know, this is basically what we're going to be talking about. Give you a super brief project background. Um, we're going to, you know, throw the study area overview map up for you and then talk about the data gathering that we've been doing, which is largely the existing conditions work. Um, we did a market analysis study and then the visual preference survey that many uh, Enfield residents participated in. And then we'll also talk about uh, next steps. All right. Um, so like I said, the uh, CROG is working with our consultant. CDM Smith is the consultant that was selected for this project to conduct a, tra a traffic impact study um, centered around the Enfield Square Mall um, site and also the surrounding roadways. Um, so basically, if the mall were to be redeveloped in the future, what would the impacts on the traffic be. Um, as I said, this was originally identified back in 2017, I believe. Um, and then we were able to release the RFQ um, in 2019. And then we did some scope modifications to get the um, project scope and the budget in alignment. And then we were able to sign the contract uh, just last year in 2021. Um, and so we've been we've been busy since. So that's what I'm going to present tonight. So as you all are probably familiar, um, this is the study area um, kind of highlighted there in the middle is the mall itself, obviously. And then um, you've got the surrounding roadways that are the focus for this study as well for um, assessing impacts. You've got uh, Route 220, 190 or Elm and Hazard. And we also have um, Freshwater, Cranbrook and uh, Paloma as well, um, specifically also identified as part of this study. I apologize. Got to make sure all the notifications are off. Um, um, were the 15 specific intersections that we're going to also be focusing on. All right, Chris, you can go ahead. Um, as I said, um, this last year, essentially, we've been focusing on the data gathering portion. So again, um, looking at existing conditions. We've been doing uh, site visits. Uh, the consultant as well as Chris and myself have gone out. Um, we've done the market analysis and then um, we've also done the visual preference survey. So we're going to kind of try to cover fairly high level still. Um, there's obviously a lot of information that's wrapped up into things like the market study and the and the survey results, um, but try to touch on for you tonight some key information uh, that we've gathered out of those processes and um, at the end touch on how we're going to use that all to inform our next steps. And just a little um, context for you, there's just a, a picture that was taken on Freshwater Boulevard right after a sidewalk ends. You can see a little uh, footpath through the grass. I think I talk about that on the next slide as well a little bit. So, Chris, okay. So, um, what we have here is sort of um, these are some images that we've taken on our site visits. So, again, the consultant did one in uh, 2021, and then um, Chris and myself we went actually just this uh, last month. And this, um, the pictures at least on this slide are focused on sort of the pedestrian observations that we saw. Um, that first photograph, there's a lot going on, but basically what we're trying to show you is um, there's a lack of marked crosswalks at some very busy intersections. 
Um, you also have some non-ADA compliant ramps where, um, you know, when your sidewalk ends and your roadway begins, you should have tactile warning strips. In a lot of locations, those are missing. Um, the narrow sidewalk that goes under the um, I, uh, I-91 bridge there is pretty narrow. Um, not sure about, you know, accessibility accommodations right now. Um, and then also flagging sort of a inconsistent or incorrect sidewalk continuation um, across driveways. Um, I think this particular example is on 220 at the mobile gas station where um, I believe your sidewalk should be kind of going across there and, and the continuation or not of a sidewalk across driveways versus roadways is sort of an indication of who's supposed to have priority at that location. Um, so something that we just wanted to, to flag for you and we saw that on our site visit. Um, additionally, what's sort of not shown here is um, uh, push buttons at some of the intersections exist. Um, they're not consistently at all corners of interse intersection, um, but um, no pet heads. So you, you might be able to push a button, but then there's no pedestrian signal for you letting you know when to go. Um, in particular, when we were on our site visit ourselves, um, we after we struggled through one intersection, we did witness an older pedestrian who had clearly pressed a button um, trying to cross 220. But um, when we sort of like looked back just to sort of see if he had made it across, he was in the process of running across because he pressed a button, but there was no indication of when he was supposed to go. Um, and then, as I said, the, the non-continuous sidewalks. Um, additionally, um, not shown uh, as pictures here, but there are also um, observations regarding vehicular observations, sort of the, the quantity of left turn demands, particularly uh, 220 and the Coles Plaza intersection, um, which we witnessed as, as well, um, resulting, I think, some unsafe decisions by motor vehicleists about trying to take gaps that are maybe a little too small or trying to squeeze in before the light turns red or in some cases, as we witnessed after the light turns red, just because they didn't want to wait through um, the signal again. Um, the consultant and ourselves on separate site visits witnessed um, some near miss crashes on 220. Um, I think our consultant noticed it at Freshwater Boulevard. We saw um, something similar, I think, at 220 and Target. Um, Additional observations for vehicles is um, the turn lanes, the demand, I think, to turn is exceeding the storage that is um, the, that is there for vehicles. And then um, simple things like there's some missing pavement markings for, you know, turn lanes and arrows that help indicate what that lane is supposed to be doing. Um, and then additionally, just a couple of other observations. Um, again, I don't have any images for this, but the consultant um, noted that potentially the pedestrian timings might not match the signal plans. So that's something that I think they'll be looking into greater detail when we dive into the traffic impact study. And that might be a way to um, remedy some of the, the confusion or the potential conflicts. And then additionally, um, something that we all noticed when we did our site visits is that there is more uh, pedestrian activity on 220 than there is on 190. And I think that's just something to keep in mind as we go through this presentation and as we um, proceed into our next steps as far as the town of Enfield thinking about what you all might like to see um, for future traffic mitigation measures, but also just generally um, what you see for 220 versus 190. Are they the same? Are they going to be treated differently because of potential access um, that you could create on 220 over to Thompsonville and, and various uh, things like that. So I think finally, Chris, after all that, you can <laughs> move the slide along. Um, so now we're into crash history. So um, the consultant looked at four years of data. So from 2017 to 2020, again, we initially did this work in 2021. Um, so that's why the, the data is only to 2020. Um, and in that four year time frame, we're looking at a total of 471 crashes. I apologize that pie chart is probably a little small, but basically the breakdown is um, most predominant type of crashes were 45% of rear end crashes. Um, Probably not super uncommon on uh, a roadway like this where you've got stoplights, lots of curb cuts for people slowing down to enter businesses. So that was the majority or, you know, the, the, the biggest um, contrib contributor to your crashes um, along this, this site area. 35% um, were angle crashes. And then I went ahead and included 12%, approximately 12% were side swipe in the same direction. Um, so you can think of those crashes as like uh, changing lanes into somebody or both going the same direction and you 
you change lanes into somebody. Um, also of note in the crash history is that there were six cyclists as well as two pedestrian uh, crashes or, or crashes that involved cyclists and pedestrians. And I do believe um, on the next slide, which we're not there yet, but um, I think they're all on 220, all of those crashes that happen involving those users. And then also of note, um, a, a lot of the crashes are minor injury or property damage only, but you did have one fatality in 2017. Um, that was the fatality that happened at St. Thomas Street on 220. Um, and then you also had three serious injuries. So you can move on from this one, Chris. All right, next we have crash history, and um, this is probably a difficult map to read sort of at a distance, but basically um, our consultant mapped all of those 471 crashes onto a map. So each dot that you see uh, represents a collision. Um, and again, I have another map coming up that is um, also incredibly useful, but what's nice about this one is you can see that pattern that I was talking about regarding um, your pedestrians and your bicycles. Again, um, that is all happening, and I'm confirming for myself yet again, that's all happening on 220, not on 190. Um, you've got the, if you can read that, red is the fatal. So again, you see that at St. Thomas, the serious injuries are orange, your pedestrians are um, yellow and your bike crashes are blue. So if you're able to see those colored dots, you can see that, that pattern emerging. All right, next slide for me, Chris. All right, next we have, um, as far as crash history, so it's it's taking that sort of cumulative number of crashes and um, grouping them together at intersections and so the color of the dot that you're seeing represents sort of the quantity of crashes that you're seeing what's probably impossible for you to see is also beside that dot is a number and that represents the crash rate so that's kind of giving you um, a better understanding sort of um, how many crashes are occurring I think relative to the amount of traffic that intersection is actually seeing so of note um, I think it's Paloma and Cranbrook um, there it's just a it's a small little green dot so it's not that many crashes necessarily but the rate is pretty high it's over um it's like 1.1 or 1.14 um which is actually a higher crash rate than your a lot of your red dots that you see on the map so it's just another useful data point um, to consider next slide for me um next we're moving into sort of um a, a, operations analysis. So um, we look at weekday um, AM and evening peak hours as well as Saturday and we, we look to see how are your intersections and your roadways functioning. Um, of note what you're going to see in the next slides are um, an existing uh, so 2021 level of service um, indication for your intersections now and then you're also going to see what's called a future no build um, and I will I'll explain that more when we get to that slide um, but for now we can, can go to the next one so again this is your level of service indicated for each one of the 15 intersections that are part of the study area. Um, and so keeping in mind for level of service, as you all are, many of you at least are probably familiar, it's a qualitative measure used to describe the quality of motor vehicle traffic service um, and analyzing your roadways and intersections by sort of categorizing traffic flow. Um, and as you can imagine, you know, green is is good. Um, it's, it's sort of like a report card, A is good, and it goes all the way to F for failing, basically. Um, a to give you sort of an example is um, very good operation. It's less than a 10 second delay. So the, the flow of your traffic is moving very well. Um, so your your weight as a motor vehicle driver is you know it, nearly inconsequential. Um, and then as you move through A, B, and C are actually all pretty good. You're starting to experience more congestion and more wait times, obviously. Um, and, it, and it does vary depending on whether it's a signalized or an unsignalized intersection. That's all keyed in, in detail on this map. And you're also seeing um, at the uh, AM peak, the evening peak for weekdays, and then that third box is your weekend. Um, so again, it, it's a lot of data. Um, and I think it'll be helpful. I'm going to ask Chris to sort of flip back and forth multiple times in just a moment. But before he does that, I just want to um, make a comment that 
Uh, I think it's important to also keep in mind as you look at these maps, that level of service is a very vehicle focused metric. So it's a very useful metric, um, but keeping in mind that in some places for certain context, depending on um, what you're trying to accomplish on the street, um, that vehicle delay isn't necessarily always a bad thing. Um, but now I'll ask Chris to flip back and forth a few times. So this is existing and now move to future. And then back to existing. Sorry, Chris, if I'm making that complicated. <laughs> and then one more time to future. There's no easy way to sort of show you on the screen unless you're like kind of looking at them side by side, but that toggling kind of gives you an idea of um, what the existing conditions are here. And then one last time, we'll, we can stay on future now. And this is your future no build. So basically, um, this is showing you that um, based on pretty modest Connecticut projections, I believe for population and employment growth, that if you don't do anything to mitigate traffic in this area, intersections that were previously doing okay, are not going to be doing as well. And additionally, um, congestion and intersections that were you know, already maybe doing poorly are in the, um, particularly in the evening and maybe the weekend peaks, it's going to start to also spill over into your morning peak period as well. So you're going to be seeing worse traffic and congestion at your intersections more frequently. Um, so again, I think this is just important to note because this is the future no build. So if nothing happens to the mall, if the mall doesn't get redeveloped at all, um, you still as a town should be considering um, what mitigation measures that you likely are gonna need to take on, on these roadways. Um, and then, you know, hopefully, regardless of what happens, the information that comes out of our traffic study at the end of all of this, will still give you very uh, helpful information on, on how to do that. Um, so next slide, please. And last, as far as um, the, the data gathering on the, the transportation roadway side of things, just touching really quick on transit services. I won't spend really any too much time on this slide because you're probably all very familiar. But of course, we wanted to take a look and see what services that you have. Um, and um, of, of note, um, you know, You've got your, your CT Transit Express bus. Um, you've got the PVTA, the fixed route with the connection to CT Transit. And you've got a couple of Magic Carpet bus um, services as well. Um, not a lot of weekend services, I think. The Magic Carpet provides some Saturday service. And then you have the some of the on-call and demand ones offering like 24-7 uh, service. But I think that's it for that one. All right, so moving on from that, um, I'll probably just try to get through all the content and then make sure that um, that we have time for questions um, at the end. But um, next, we're going to dive into the market study. Um, this might be difficult to read, um, so I'll go ahead and read it. This is a snippet from our executive summary of the market study, which is available on our website. You can read the whole thing. Um, but basically, this says multifamily residential was identified as a primary opportunity along with other types of housing. Specific types of retail, including big box restaurants and retail integrated into mixed use development, were also found to have market potential despite the vacancy struggles of the mall property. Um, so we got some really great feedback and information from the market study that was conducted, identifying uh, separate market feasible uses for the potential redevelopment of the, the mall property itself. Um, so how they do this, um, that's fine, you can go to that one, yeah. Um, comprehensive data analysis um, is supplemented with additional research as well as um, what the consultant calls market intelligence interviews um, that they did with local real estate, um, you know, if it, uh, experts, developers, the property owner themselves. Um, I think Metro Hartford Alliance was one of them. So folks knowledgeable about local market conditions uh, were, were also interviewed. Um, as part of the market study, what they do is they identify the market area. So looking at commute patterns within the region, the market area forms a reasonable representation um, for, you know, who would partake in the market segments that were studied or evaluated, which are listed there on the left. So you've got your um, residential multifamily uh, market analysis. Um, you've got your retail, commercial, industrial, and tourism. Um, for the residential, uh, the market study 
talks about um, there's a demand for upscale uh, residential as well as workforce affordable and senior living. Um, and this is apartments and townhomes um, were identified or condos. Um, for the retail piece, um, I think, you know, the previous slide talks about sort of the big box stores, as well as the mixed use and pedestrian friendly, the smaller scale retail, as well as some mid and upscale even uh, restaurants. Um, and then for the office, oh, no surprise there, there's not really a demand for office. This was kind of true, um, not just in Connecticut and, you know, before the pandemic, and it hasn't gotten any better, um, but they did identify some demand for medical office space. So um, that is that is on the table. Um, for industrial, um, I will say that they did identify distribution and fulfillment centers and warehousing type uses as a viable use. Um, however, um, because of the, the current zoning and the fact that you guys have um, additional areas or other areas already in and field zoned for this, um, we kind of have set that aside for the moment. So if there's any other questions on that, now would be an excellent time to let me know and would inform sort of how we proceed. Um, and then and last, last on the on tourism the and hospitality uh, analysis, um, that was that that came in pretty strongly. You have a, I think it's a market market potential index. I've got that wrong. I talk about it a little a little later on, um, but it's pretty high in Enfield actually for this type of use. So that was definitely flagged. Um, additionally, in looking at all of these um, different uh, segments of um, of the market, they also looked at demographic and other economic data, and they also looked at other mall redevelopment trends that um, that they're seeing around the country. Then they used as sort of key studies to help guide us um, as as we move forward. Next slide. Um, so the big question is, right, um, how much and of what can be supported? Um, so basically, they identified that 138 rental units per year for five years could be um, could be supported. This is a total of uh, 690 units. Um, they also identified that about 20 to 30 townhomes, again, per year for five years, so 300 units could potentially be supported. And that as well, um, you've got about 100 to 150,000 square feet of mixed use retail with residential. And I think that's key that um, that number is contingent on residential units coming online to support that retail. Um, and in addition to that retail, additionally, maybe two restaurants, as I said earlier, I think some mid uh, upscale restaurants. And then again, on that medical office piece, about 38,000 square feet of medical office could be supported. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I think that's it. I think I covered everything on that slide that I wanted to. Next slide, please. So next, um, and, and kind of least as far as the, the data, the data dump for you all tonight, if you will, we've got our visual preference survey, um, which I just, I kind of want to thank everybody here, because um, I'm sure a lot of you participated or maybe helped um, get the word out. Um, I don't know what I was expecting for a response rate, but um, you all did amazing. Um, we had over 1,000 uh, responses. 84% of um, the responses that we received were from Enfield that put down an Enfield zip code. Um, we also got about 10% from other Connecticut towns um, and about 2% from other Massachusetts towns. And I think that leaves us with a remainder about 4% from you know, other areas of the country. But um, great to know that we had such a great response rate and that so many of them were from Enfield. So you've got a pretty good sense maybe, um, I think of how your, your community feels about the certain uh, the themes that we asked, which um, are listed below. Again, I'll read them because that's a little small, maybe. Um, but we basically asked questions about uh, seven themes related to building density, site layout and parking, building architecture, building heights, residential uses, entertainment uses, and then also bike pedestrian amenities. Um, and so basically, um, you know, you go through the survey, we tell you a little bit what we mean when we're saying, you know, talk to us about building density. What do you think? And we showed uh, various images and asked um, everybody who responded to please select based on, you know, a rating scale of very desirable, okay, or not desirable, how they felt about each of those images. So you can move on for me, Chris. Um, so again, I'm not going to touch on all the details of the visual preference survey. Um, there's a lot of data there. Um, I'm happy to, um, Lori has this information. Um, we probably 
could maybe work on putting it together um, a little bit more comprehensively than what you're going to see here if you're curious in a way that's a little bit more digestible than what Lori has. Um, so I'm going to try to hit some of the higher um, points of interest here. Um, one of the themes, as I mentioned, was building density. So we tried to define that for the survey takers to say that's the relationship of the storefronts and the parking and the access to the store. So please focus on access when you're thinking about how desirable or not you feel these images are for Enfield. Um, and then down below, um, we we showed them pictures of a strip mall. We showed them two different versions of an outdoor commercial mall. We showed them standalone retail and then multiple standalone retail as well. Um, and so, for example, the standalone retail, for example, would be the Best Buy image. Um, outdoor commercial mall, we showed them two, like I said. One was a um, sort of a more, a, um, what is the word I want? Like a like an outlets mall where it's pedestrian only access to the stores really on that internal corridor. And then we also showed Evergreen Walk as another example where you have pedestrian and vehicular access. Um, and then those numbers on the right, trying to show you a lot of information um, a little bit concisely here but basically that first number if you look at outdoor commercial mall for example 65 percent of respondents found that to be very desirable 25 percent found the outdoor commercial mall evergreen walk example to be okay so basically you've got a total of what are we looking at 90 percent of people that i'd call comfortable with some sort of idea around like an outdoor commercial mall to give you a sense of what folks might be interested in seeing should that mall property be redeveloped. Next slide. All right, so next um, we had site layout and parking. So how the buildings and the parking areas um, are oriented on the site and we also have building heights. Um, I don't really have any sort of summary here for you for the site layout and parking. Of note, I will say we showed an image of a parking garage um, and 62% of people that responded said that was not desirable. Um, I will say we picked a nice parking garage. It was brick, but um, it was definitely a parking garage. Um, we didn't show an example of like a wrapped parking garage with, you know, retail wrapped with the parking garage sort of tucked in and hidden beside. I think because we weren't sure how we would really be able to convey that to people taking the survey. Um, but like I said, not a lot of people found it to be very desirable. Um, and even some of the written in comments flagged um, safety concerns relative to, to parking garages. Um, and then we also had building heights. Again, this is pretty pretty clear. This is the height of buildings. Um, we asked them, how do you feel about a one-story building, a three-story building, four to six, and seven to eight? Those were all different questions. Um, and we asked about the taller stories just because um, I believe that's what allow, what is currently allowed through zoning, maybe through some density bonuses um, or other bonuses of various kinds to get you to that. But your zoning currently allows for that on the site. And basically the feedback we got on that was not super, not super desirable. Um, I was um, a little surprised actually by 95%. Um, this is a combined number right here, by the way, if the, the little key is trying to indicate to you that um, very desirable and okay. 95% of people who responded um, felt that way about one story buildings. Um, and then 66% of people, which is still pretty good, that's you know a, a solid majority of people still felt comfortable with three-story buildings. Um, and I think some of the issues or the concerns that folks had um, with the taller story buildings and the written comments, um, which is again, what's kind of why it's helpful to have that, is um, concern for losing the small town feel and also accessibility um, to units was, was one of the concerns cited. Next slide, please. All right, so this one is um, a summary of sort of your residential uses. Um, we uh, we also preface the survey by letting people know, because again, this is a visual preference survey for the mall area. People might be confused about us asking about residential uses potentially. So we did ask folks or we, you know, we let folks know that the market study for this area indicates that residential uses could do well at this location. So we did provide them that little bit of information and then ask people to focus when thinking about residential use on um, how you as a tenant or a homeowner, whatever the case may be, would access your building and how you would share space potentially. Um, 
So for example, that first townhome listed is the image that you see there at the top. This is an individual door that only you have access to your unit. You don't really share any space. Um, this scored very highly. 36% of people found it to be very desirable. 40% said it was okay. So overall, again, pretty pretty high um, comfort level there with townhomes um, that don't share space. Um, the next bullet there, this is townhomes with like a shared hallway or a shared courtyard, didn't score as well. Um, so unsurprisingly as well, um, the apartments where you typically have that sort of shared central doorway and you share hallways and your units are off of that, scored probably the lowest, I think it was, with 12% um, saying very desirable only. Um, and and of note, that would apply to whether it's a condo, so whether it's an ownership unit or a rental unit, apartments didn't score quite as high. Um, and then last, um, mixed use is interesting. We showed that image that you see there on the bottom. 38% um, said very desirable, 30% said okay. And this is just interesting because this is the first time I think we had shown in the survey that vertical mixed use idea, you know, ground floor, commercial, residential above. Um, and is a little bit in conflict with conflict, sorry, with the story, the, the building height story information that we received, which was again 95% people were, you know, felt it was desirable or okay for one story building, but then you have a mixed story also scoring pretty high, you know, relative especially to everything that you see here for residential uses. So that's something to keep in mind as well. And then I think this is um, sort of the last, you know, um, hard data point about from the visual preference survey, but we did ask about the entertainment use. So I talked earlier about the market potential index. That's MPI is what it's called. Um, so basically for Enfield, the MPI index for entertainment uses was over 100. And how it works is that um, the MPI value, if it equals 100, basically that represents the, the national demand. So if you have something more than 100, it means that that particular area has a higher demand for that use. So your residents would have a greater participation rate in that activity than say the normal, the national average. And that was the case that the market study found for entertainment uses. So um, not maybe a typical part of a visual preference survey. This is not, you know, not classic visual preference survey at least, but we took the opportunity to ask folks um, to get a little feedback on maybe what they would like to see to sort of, you know, this is helpful information for a developer that maybe want to redevelop to know what you know? What are your residents going to come and, and participate in, right? So, um, brewery scored the highest. It won at 83%. Um, followed closely though by your movie theaters or a concert venue at 82. Um, and you can see the rest there: indoor golf, indoor sports complex, all scored very high. Um, and again, this is a combined number that I'm showing you here. We also asked them about gyms, indoor water parks, um, and a hotel. We, we got some comments back on the hotel. The hotel scored about 58% for you know, purposes of comparison here. And then I'm almost done. Um, last, for the visual preference survey, I'm not going to read these. These were just a, two quotes out of um, over 900 written in responses that we got in addition to all of the other data points. Um, so I'll let you take a look at these as you'd like. Um, but just some general feedback then, you know, again, retail alone is, is not what folks are looking for. I think a, a consensus around some sort of residential, certainly not, you know, 100% consensus. Folks um, did have concerns on traffic. Um, that was another, I'd say, consensus is that, that there is consensus on traffic congestion and traffic as a concern, um, but making it more pedestrian friendly, integrating more residential into a retail space. Um, and, you know, uh, there is also themes about reconnecting to Thompsonville as well and, and creating, you know, more green space, um, bike lanes and sidewalks. I don't focus on, I don't highlight it here in the presentation, but again, we did ask about bike lanes and bike pet accommodations. And I think some of the reason why um, I forget off the top of my head what it scored, um, but some of the no's at least for bike and ped um, seem to come from a concern for safety. So that's that's worth noting. Um, again, I did ask questions on themes that I haven't highlighted in this presentation. Um, again, haven't talked too much about the transit feedback or the building architecture. Um, New England architecture was was the favorite, I guess, if you, you could say from the survey result. Um, and 
of note on the building architecture and some of the other questions that we asked. Some of this information is going to more directly um, feed into our next steps. Um, and some of it is just, I think, useful information for the town, for planning and zoning commission, um, for a developer, as far as, again, what the, the residents in Enfield are interested in, what might help streamline their processes. Um, so it's not information that's going to get lost. Um, as I said, the town has all of the results from the visual preference survey, um, but not all of it will be carried through um, directly. Next slide, please. Okay, and I promise we are almost done. This is pretty much my last slide. Um, just really quick for next steps. Um, we're working on creating a future redevelopment option, and that option is what's going to be assessed for traffic impacts. So in, in sort of very high level, our next step is going to be a traffic impact study. Um, and then we're going to look at mitigation strategies for the traffic that is generated. Um, Originally, I will say without, you know, trying to muddy the waters too much, originally we were scoped to look at three land use alternatives for the site. Um, but as of right now, unless I hear it differently, you know, feedback from anybody tonight, we're not really sure that that's necessary. Um, based on the results of the market study and what can be, you know, a viable mix of land uses and how much land use, um, there's no real need to do any sort of give and take or decision making on a variety of alternatives. We can kind of fit it all. Um, so that's kind of that, you know, that next piece based on market study, some site constraints, current zoning. Um, instead of doing, you know, three alternatives, we're, we're kind of thinking that maybe we should just plan for a maximum build out. The idea behind this is, you know, Regardless of what happens at the site, um, it can fit all of these things, um, the 690 residential units, the 300 townhomes, 180 square feet of retail, 38,000 square feet of medical office, and I think it's 65,000 feet of entertainment uses. If you create a traffic impact study based off of that, so this is what the market study is saying is valuable. Um, if you create a traffic impact study, that uses that sort of as its starting point, the town will get a very good understanding of what the impact of that maximum build out will be and how to mitigate it. And then regardless of what happens to the mall site, um, whether the developer retrofits the mall, whether they demolish the mall, as long as they do that maximum build out or less, you'll have a pretty good understanding of what your traffic impacts are gonna be and how you're gonna need to mitigate it. Um, so we're, we're still in discussions with town staff and would love to hear your feedback um, and, you know, probably with Connecticut uh, Department of Transportation, also CTDOT, um, we'll, you know, need to work in concert with them as well as we move forward. But just trying to think of what is going to be um, the most useful information for the town. And at this point, based on, you know, again, the, the market study feedback that we got, um, site constraints, um, there are certain parcels that have been subdivided that um, we're not really planning to touch. Um, and current zoning, again, that's mostly focused on the fact that um, where housing uses and distribution uses are viable per the market study, but are not currently allowed by zoning. So based on all that information, um, we think it might possibly make more sense to, to focus on the, the traffic impact piece um, and mitigation strategies for you going forward. But um, as well, I should also mention, Next steps also include um, taking, you know, this land use development alternative, um, doing a financial feasibility analysis on that, and then we'll look at um, the build up potential of those uses, and then we move into the, the traffic impact and mitigation uh, piece as well. So I, I think that's all I have. I think you can move ahead one slide, Chris, I suppose. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice presentation. I think I'll open it up for any comments or questions by fellow commissioners and, or staff at this point. I'm looking around. Question. Commissioner Limo. Good evening. Thank you for the presentation. Um, in the beginning of your presentation, you talked about sidewalks, crosswalks, traffic lights. Then at the end of your presentation, which I'm glad to hear that you're going to be talking with DLT. But back to the beginning of, the tr of your presentation, it seems like those items are non-compliant currently. Um, is there an issue or a problem, or does that need to be corrected? Um, the safety hazards uh, with the sidewalks, crosswalks, and um, traffic signals. Thank you. 
excellent question. And um, I mean, I think the answer is, is yes. Um, and how the process exactly works, obviously, a lot of the study area on the roadways here are state routes. Um, so how that exactly works with DOT and, and the process for that. Um, I also do know um, that there, every town I think is supposed to have an ADA transition plan. Um, a lot of towns don't, but it, it gets at addressing and putting a plan in place for identifying these you know, out of compliant location and then having a plan in place um, to fix them. Um, and it can be, you know, it can, the plan can be, I think, as simple as like, we're going to address five intersections a year because this is our, you know, these are our budget constraints and our staff capacity realities. Um, I don't have a ton of information on that, but I mean, yes, for sure. And I think, you know, in our final report, we're going to be you know, detailing that out a bit and, and saying what you need to do to, to bring yourself up to compliance. But, but if I may, Thank you. if I might follow up as chairman, isn't especially on 220? It's again, that's a state road. So are you implying that the basically the town of Enfield is on the hook for making that ADA compliant and fixing those crosswalks, or is that the state of Connecticut's responsibility? That is a good I mean, question. Through you, um, through CROG, I, because I know how that works with you know transportation part. It would seem mm -hmm. to me that's the state of Connecticut's responsibility. We should identify those issues. It's not our road. Mm -hmm. and, and I can I definitely, definitely flag, flag that, that as, as far as as, um, as we move forward, um, maybe into the final report when we get to that point, um, identifying, you know, responsibilities and roles. In my experience so far, and this, you know, don't take this as gospel, I can definitely kind of confirm this question for you. Um, on previous work that we've done on state roads, um, the, the the work that goes across the intersections, like across 220, um, I believe that typically falls to the state. Any of the side road pieces, though, um, typically, I think, fall to the municipality. Um, so I'm not sure that entirely answers your question, but... No, thank you. It's a, it's a start. Thank you. Commissioner D'Antonio? Uh, yeah, I, I had two questions. Thanks for your presentation. It was great. Uh, the first question is, how unique is the um, uh, the area for development uh, compared to the region? You know, taking into account um, you know location, uh, location of the highway, location of Thompsonville, uh, local transit. Um, how how unique is it to you know our surrounding towns? I'm gonna write it down. Otherwise, I will. Attention to the track of my, my answer, answer to your, to your question. question. Um, so, so I would say I would say it depends on probably the use. Um, and it's been a while since I've read the market study in full detail. Um, and it's probably do another look. And I would definitely encourage you. Um, again, like I said, it is available on our project website at Krog, and I got that little guy down there, um, which. Typing that in is probably uh, more complicated than it's worth. If you just go to the CROG website and search for Enfield, it'll pop up for you. Um, but like I said, of, of note, um, the Enfield, uh, the entertainment use, I'm sorry, that came out of the market city was particularly unique, I think, for Enfield. Um, I don't know how you compare um, in the in like the rest of the market area for you know housing for example um one of the interesting points that i i did see recently in the market study was you know as far as multifamily housing at least for for residential um 75 about 75 percent of enfield's current housing is single family so i think the demand for multifamily might exist um and I, I think also it did mention that a lot of the multifamily that currently exists is in buildings that are nine units or less. Um, so there's not a lot of offerings, um, like a slightly more dense version. And when I say dense, I mean, I don't mean necessarily crazy. I mean, you could you could do something two or three story um, to, again, support that retail as well. Um, the, the residential is needed to support the retail that was um, Said that was viable um and i don't know i don't know that anything else of note th that i can recall is jumping out at me for for uniqueness to your point um i think the proximity of thompsonville though um is potentially you know a huge boon for this particular site and location it's not far away the current pedestrian accommodations is at least you know on the pedestrian side of things um 
makes it seem much further. Um, um, we didn't we didn't even walk down nearly that far. Um, we didn't even make it to Route Five before the lack of pedestrian buttons and and crosswalks um, seemed a little too daunting to to want to do that by foot. Um, but I think that could present a, a very unique opportunity. And I think when we were going into the market study, what we what we wanted to make sure to do is that um, the uses that you would put here at, at the mall site, for example, in a future redevelopment situation, um, that they wouldn't compete with what you have in Thompsonville. Um, and I, I believe the city speaks to that. Uh, my second question, um, Lori, this one goes to you and staff as much. Um, just to kind of clarify, I assume there's going to be coordination with COG in terms of uh, reviewing our existing zoning and making proposals to make uh, uh, certain development possible. Is that accurate? Yes, I would say it's accurate. I, you know, we've been working um, with them for, well, well over a year now. and. Uh, um, we and we also have been talking about the fact that we're going to be redoing our zoning regulations, and so that will be um, an item, possibly maybe put into the POCD. Um, but absolutely, um, we're looking at that. I, I do also want to comment that the owners of the Enfield Square Mall have been involved with the study, and have given their input as to what they would like to see as well. So it, you know, and that's something that. You know, that's where we got a lot of these um, ideas as well, as, uh, aside from the visual preference survey. Great, I'll thanks. Also, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, but I will add for you, um, specifically to your question regarding the zoning, there is a task in the scope that um, has our consultant team identifying uh, recommendations to zoning um, for that very reason. So if, if, you know, we identify something that your zoning currently doesn't allow that, through this process we want or you know vice versa um that we would be making recommendations for for the town to be able to consider thank you for one, and we have been discussing this in the part of the pocd too chris um so i, I imagine that's going to come up in discussions when we start talking about that in september commissioner Holinsky? yes uh i had a question about the uh you you mentioned there was uh there were uh, several more pedestrian type accidents on Elm Street versus Route 190. Uh, is the volume of pedestrian uh, traffic on 220 also higher than 190? Or do I would know say at this one? Yes. yes. I don't, I don't know, know that, that we have bike ped count. Like, I don't know that a count has been done um, in in recent time by the town. I, I don't believe it was. Um, I don't know that the consultant did it. They did count, um, but I'm not sure if it covered bike and ped. Um, and again, anecdotally, I will say that when we were out there again, we were on foot and we and we did a vehicle tour as well. Um, way more pedestrians on 220. I think we saw one bicyclist actually using the sidewalk on 190 in our in our time there um but 220 was was pretty heavily traveled all things considered and and chris and i were going non-peak um and saw a good handful of people including you know a woman pushing her stroller um and it was also interesting there was quite a few sort of like smaller like moped vehicles as well they were they were in the roadway uh, which is good um but uh yeah i i think anecdotally and potentially also crash or um like head count. I will confirm for you if that happened and what the data says on that. And um, so, so do you have any theory behind why that traffic in on that road is is higher with pedestrian traffic? Is there any kind of reasoning for that? I think that's a good question, and I think I would I would love to hear um, from you know the folks at this meeting um, if you have any insight onto why that's happening. I think some of it is potentially the the uses maybe that you have along 220. Um, I think some of it is the character. I mean, some you know of the of the bike and pedestrian, well, not really bike, um, but the pedestrian infrastructure that you have on 220 is incomplete. But you do tend to have it at least on both sides of the road, which I know is not the case on 190. There's some pretty big stretches um, where there's no sidewalk along the road there, um, and you know some some key intersections that. I, I was trying to, I forget which intersection that is at 190 and potentially 
fresh water. Um, but the massive, you know, access to one of the, the, the shopping center there, um, but no ped button, like no way to feel like you can safely cross. Um, so there's a, a bit more present, I would say, on, on 220. Um, but I'll- and, and, and if Elm Street is, is more of a straight corridor to the Thompsonville district. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll so I that may, may that may be something that, second. what, I'm sorry. If I may jump in for half a second, to, uh, Elm, Elm Street, Street is a better connection to Thompsonville. 190 just hooks into uh, going over the Connecticut River. So over the overpass, to, but but I do a lot of traveling on 190 because I live off of 190, and I, I notice a lot of foot traffic, regardless of sidewalk or not. They're walking, making their own paths, you know, from from Hazardville to Palumba Drive. You know, there's a lot of a lot of traffic, and there are bicyclists there too. Now, perhaps they make a quick turn and go into Balumba, and now they're in the, you know, now they're in the mall type area. So, so maybe you don't see as many, um, you know, in front of the shopping centers and so on. But uh, anyway, it's just just a few questions, uh, clarifications. Thank you, Commissioner Lionel. Yes, um, just a, a follow up. Um, on that crash information in the pedestrian um, info, could you break it down by years? Because I think some of the years that were studied were during the pandemic. Not tonight, but I just want to see the crash uh, information during the pandemic versus uh, not in the pandemic. I can, I can definitely, definitely get you that. Yeah, I know we have it. Um, um, and I was actually looking, looking at it because I was, was I couldn't I, remember off the top of my head when the fatality had occurred, so I had to look at the data for the to get the 2017 date and i can tell you that there was many fewer crashes that happened in 2020 i think probably as a result of just not nearly as many people being on the road going to work so your your am and your your peak travel i think was much less um and i recall that like 2017 2018 2019 all of your trips um or your 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 crashes, rather, your crashes were well or over a hundred, some more than others. And then I think in 2020, you're looking like mid 80. So it definitely took a, a noticeable dip. But I can get you the specifics. Okay, yeah. And I and just to dovetail, I think Mr. Herlinski is correct about 190 and Elm. 190, there's really no way. Uh, there's no access. There's not really a lot of residential around 190. Elm Street is surrounded by residential. So I think that that's the key. But, and then oh, definitely I, a question I just for you all as far as, as um, yeah, can, you know, you know what, what do you want to do you want to build, build on that, that um, 220, 220 being a slightly more pedestrian, more pedestrian friendly, friendly access, access piece, piece, piece and do you, and you want, want to build, build on that on connection that. to Thompsonville. Um, that's definitely something that, you know, feedback like that will be helpful for us as we move forward. Okay, Ken. okay yeah, I just had a, a comment based on uh, Commissioner Olimo's uh, comments. Um, I see a lot of people walking 190 um, across the overpass over 91 towards Thompsonville and taking that, that exit that uh, you know, connects up to Route 5. And they seem to be mainly workers, mm -hmm. you know, restaurant workers, because they have their uniforms on. And so there's a lot of that kind of traffic mm -hmm. going that way. Now, they must live in that area versus the Elm Street area, mm -hmm. you know. But that seems to me that's really dangerous. It's <laughs> it, 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 dangerous. Because you know, people are getting on to 91, they're coming off 91. And uh, mm -hmm. so that's, that's something to keep in mind. Yeah. And there's never been a sidewalk there other than a man-made one. There's no, a path that's been there yeah. since yeah. I was a kid yeah. that people have been tramping on. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions for Commissioner LaFagas? Yes, um, that's a lot of information to process. Um, when, when you were going over the, um, the survey results with uh, a townhouse and uh, mixed use business downstairs and residential upstairs, you noted an inconsistency in the um, survey results. But I thought there, there was another inconsistency where the uh, retail space on the first floor and residential upstairs was preferred. It conflicts with the um, the preference for a private entrance as well, and, and likely if you have retail downstairs and living space upstairs, you're going to need a common entrance. So th I, that, I, this is just a comment, not a question. Yeah, yeah. and I think that's, that's what, what um, um, it's a good, good comment. And I actually, when I was putting the slide together, I had a similar thought. Um, 
and I think maybe it speaks to the desire for a mix. And, you know, being being very desirable for, you know, a townhouse with an individual door doesn't necessarily mean that the same person didn't also say very desirable for the mixed use because they were able to do that. All set. Well, I want to thank you very much. And uh, basically, I do concur with your next steps, working with staff to, to go on to the next level of this study. Uh, I do appreciate you being with us tonight and all the information you shared with us. And. I think it's very helpful for us to get a good understanding of where you are and where we are in town staff and where we're going forward with this. So without further ado, I think we're going to move on. Again, thank you for uh, doing this presentation for us tonight. Do appreciate it. Thank you so much. I'm sure to get this thank copy you. to Lori. Okay, thank you. Thank you again. Thank, thank you so much. much. Cheers. Thank you, Caitlin and Chris. All right, if you just give us a couple minutes so we get technically uh, cleaned up from this presentation. Okay, we'll be all set. I'm just going to grab a drink of water and we're we'll going. Then we'll, we'll, we'll read it and then I'll let you. Okay. <coughs> Are you all set? No. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to get it. I don't know. Yeah, these are new chairs. I don't know. I'm sorry. No, we're not recessing. Yeah. All right. We're ready to start again. Oop. We're just doing some musical chairs. Are you all set to read uh, the pH? Yes. Yep. Okay, guys, we're starting. Okay, we're starting back up. Moving on to the next item in the agenda, new public hearings, PH 3040MA. Would Secretary please read the opening of this public hearing? The Enfield. the Enfield Planning and Zoning Commission will hold a public hearing at the regular meeting Thursday, June 30th, 2022 at 7 p.m. in the Town Hall uh, Council Chambers at 820 Enfield Street, Enfield, Connecticut, concerning the following application, PH 3040MA, 1297 Enfield Street, zone change request for HR 33 to SDD, uh, Felician Sisters of North America Real Estate, applicant owner, map 49, lot 2, HR 33 zone. Thank you very much. Be before we start, Commissioner Grillo would like to uh, mention something for the record. Thank you. Your mic on. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Uh, this for the applicant um, question. Does the applicant want me to recuse myself from the public uh, meeting tonight? Yes, we do, uh, Mr. Grillo. We do. It. Based upon your comments in September, I think uh, to paraphrase, I think your comments were that uh, you would not approve this uh, this zone change no matter what, what uh, proposal was being made. I'm paraphrasing, I didn't get a chance to go back and look. I didn't know that uh, you were gonna be seated tonight uh, because you're, I believe you're an alternate. So, uh, but since you've asked the question uh, to me, I have to answer in the affirmative. Yes, we are requesting that you recuse yourself and that uh, the chairman sit somebody else. Okay. Um, Whether you do so or not is up to you. I'm just uh, making the request. Out of respect uh, for the board, I'm going to grant you that. I'm going to recuse, and um, I wish you and the Felician sisters well. Thank you, sir. Mr. Grill, thank you. Appreciate it. Having said that, we, we do have two alternates that will be sitting in tonight, as you already know. Commissioner Lafakis is sitting in for one of the regular members. Commissioner Grillo was sitting in for one of the regular members. Commissioner D'Antoni will now um, pick up that, that lantern. I do want to mention with that is that, as both of you well know, the regular commissioners next meeting, if they watch the tape, they catch up on all the minutes, can request to be seated back again. It's really going to be up to those two individuals, those regular members, their decision. I'm not sure what they're going to do, but we'll wait and see. But in the meantime, at least tonight, you, you are full-time members in this hearing. The other thing I need to mention also is we, we did recognize the receiving of a petition tonight to cause a supermajority for, for a vote on this issue. Um, this uh, uh, petition has not been verified or certified yet. The staff still has to do that. So based on that, we have no idea whether it would cause us to have to firm this with five votes or four votes. 
And so we will not be voting on anything tonight. I just want to let everyone know that right up front until we have clarification on a petition so there will be no votes tonight. We'll proceed with the hearing and we will be leaving the hearing open. Also, one other thing, if you don't mind, <laughs> Attorney Landolina, anyone who wishes to speak tonight after they're done with their presentation, please sign up on the uh, sign-up sheets here. So we'll be using that to uh, indicate who's the next in line to speak. So I think, and the roll call here for this hearing, please. Lou Fiore. Here. Virginia Higley. Here. Linda DeGray. Here. John Petronella. Absent. Frank Alimo. Here. Karam Mudar Absent. Ken Holinsky. Here. Vinny Grillo is absent for this portion. Christian D'Antonio. Here. Nick Lefakis. Here. Thank you. There is a, a quorum here of, of seven, so please uh, proceed. Identify yourselves for the record, please. I guess if you don't mind, all of you, if you don't mind, and then we can proceed. Yes. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. My name is Attorney Carl Landolina from Fahey and Landolina in Windsor Locks, representing the applicants, the Felician Sisters of North America, Real Estate Trust, I believe, is the full name of the owner of the property. Um, so just there, I think there's a few of you, at least the chairman and Mr. D'Antonio, weren't here in September when we came before this very commission seeking the same zone change. Um, we heard from the commission as well as members of the public uh, about a number of things. So we decided the best course of action would be to withdraw that application, which we did. And we went back to uh, the drawing board, so to speak, uh, the development team did, and um, came up with uh, a new proposal, uh, which you're gonna see tonight, which we believe took into consideration some of the comments and concerns we, we heard from the commission as well as the public. And, and uh, we did some other things which you're gonna hear about tonight in terms of informing the public of the project as uh, we would like to propose it tonight. So um, I'm joined here, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, to the extreme left is Sister Nancy, she tells me I can't pronounce her last name, so I won't try. She's a, a Felician sister of long standing. She's going to give you sort of an overview of how we got to the place we are tonight. Um, and uh, to her right is uh, Bridget Armstrong, who is a member of the uh, Felician sisters family. Um, and seated to my uh, left, is um, Kristen Anderson, who's with the development team at the Community Builders. They are the development team of choice, handpicked by the uh, Felician Sisters. We've got some folks uh, behind me, which are here, if you have any more, I guess, technical questions. Um, and they include uh, Miles Brown from the architectural firm of Amenta Emma, uh, a, a, a very uh, prestigious architectural firm across the country as well as uh, Stephanie White from the firm of Fuss and O'Neill, again, uh, a top-notch engineering firm located in, in Manchester, Connecticut, who can answer more of the uh, technical questions that, that you might have. So um, we're gonna start, and, and then I'll make my last presentation on what I think are the legal aspects of stuff you don't really need to hear about, but I have to tell you anyway for the record. So uh, the ladies will go first, followed by uh, you know the ogre attorney. So thank you. You can use that. Okay. No. Should be on. There it is. Okay. Well, good evening. As uh, Greg said, my name is Sister Nancy. For the record, my name is. Sister Nancy Marie Pietsevich, and most people have difficulty with that name. Until a year ago, I lived on the Enfield campus since 1980, and many of you in the neighborhood have probably have seen me over the years walking the three convent dogs that we had. Last year, I was elected to serve on the provincial leadership team, which is our governing body overseeing the sisters in our ministries across North America. Just to put some things in context about a little bit of history of the Felician sisters. In 1874, five sisters traveled from Poland to America to minister to the Polish immigrants. They had no idea what they were to do, but they carried within them the desire to go wherever the people needed them. Over the years, the Felician sisters planted seeds, always responding to the needs of the time 
We had child care centers in high schools, colleges, and universities. We opened hospitals and nursing homes, senior living facilities, and various social service and outreach centers, soup kitchens and food pantries, retreat centers, and yes, even street ministries to the homeless were also part of our responses to the needs we found around us. Teaming up with our many dedicated lay partners over the years, many of these ministries continue to exist to carry on the dream and the words of our founders, to love is to serve. Always looking to where the needs are and remaining faithful to our calling, we continue to look for new ways to respond to the current needs. In recent years, as our numbers began to dwindle here on the Enfield campus, we, the sisters, began to realize that things needed to change, that nothing ever remains the same, that we could no longer sustain what was. We recognize, including ourselves, that nobody likes change, except perhaps a wet baby. We would all like to go back to what was, to our comfort zones. It's scary to risk doing something new. But we, the sisters, realize that doing nothing is not a viable option. After much prayer and discussion, we began to dream of possibilities. Knowing that we could not do this on our own, we reached out to others who have the expertise that we lack. We hired a consulting firm to help us identify the needs that exist in the Enfield community and how we might better help serve those needs. Two pressing needs surfaced. They were affordable housing for seniors and low-income working families. After a few years of vetting builders and developers, we teamed up with the Community Builders, a nonprofit organization, because their values in their operating model is in sync with our Felician core values. We sisters have no children to pass on our legacy, but we do have the community within which we have lived the broader community of Enfield. It is our hope that we can continue to respond to the new needs of our time and make the lives of those around us a bit better. With the passing of his own change, we can create a thriving intergenerational campus where all feel safe and accepted. For doing nothing is not an option. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Hello. Okay. Sorry, couldn't hear. That's good. So, um, the Felicians have always been visionary. Uh, they're smart. Uh, they're hardworking. Um, they're committed, determined, and they're realistic. They recognized they needed a plan uh, on their campus, and because their community is declining. And there are only 24 sisters on the campus currently. Consequently, they've had to close buildings and they've had to consolidate their living spaces. And closed and empty portion of buildings cost money to maintain, even at the most basic level. Ongoing, this is not financially sustainable. Doing nothing is not an option. The Felicians don't want to leave their home. They want to be able to continue to support the ministries on the campus, Enfield Montessori School, and the senior apartments at St. Francis Residence. And they don't want to just stay on the campus. They want to make something better for everyone in the town of Enfield, like they always have, because they are called to serve where is needed. When the sisters began dreaming of the future possibilities of the campus, they asked themselves, how do we continue to serve the town of Enfield? And lo and behold, they recognized they had already planted a seed on the campus, and it was already growing. It was an intergenerational campus started between their two ministries, Enfield Montessori and St. Francis Residence. They want the future possibilities to maintain the character of their campus, their beautiful buildings, and to protect the historic land. In 90 years, the Felician sisters want people to remember who they are by how 
they served the community through housing, education, supportive services, and mostly love of neighbor. Their legacy will be preserved because the Felician sisters will continue to own and oversee the property. The Felician sisters built their beautiful campus and they want to see it sustained through an intergenerational campus by adapting their buildings. And as they themselves have said, it is time for transformation. This will provide an economic benefit to the town of Enfield by taxes that will be paid and attracting working families that not only will work in Enfield, but shop and eat. And the sisters don't want to just build spaces. They want to build homes where sisters on the campus have access, as well as the residents, to wellness services like physical therapy, a care manager, community space. Families on the campus would have a beautiful yard, their own play space, after school programming, and a fitness center. Nature is very important to the sisters and the project preserves specimen trees, it creates walking paths, and the buildings are designed to be lead silver or greater. After considering the uh, large amount of community feedback that we went out uh, and gathered, um, the updated plan that you'll see in a moment consists of 250 units while maintaining 90% of the green space. Five existing buildings would be preserved and two new buildings would be constructed. The new buildings you'll see in a moment will be built in the back of the property behind existing structures and their height will not exceed four stories, which is the height of the current buildings, thereby ensuring the existing view of the campus is maintained and that view from Enfield Street. We estimate that in 10 years, and this is a 10 year plan done over the course of four phases. So in 10 years, there would be a little over 300 people on the campus, about half of which would be seniors. Over half the units proposed will be for seniors. And of the 250 units being proposed, 80%, just under 80%, will be one bedroom. And the balance, or 53 units, will be two bedroom. There are no three bedroom, there are no four bedroom units. And this number of two bedroom units limits the number of children on the campus, which we're estimating to be in the range of 16 to 53 children. So what does an intergenerational campus look like? Well, first, the sisters are still present. This development will not displace or cause the sisters to have to move. There will be more senior housing available to those seniors with a fixed income of $40,000 or less and who will enjoy, along with the sisters, amenities for them. As I've mentioned before, wellness services, sitting in a gazebo, enjoying nature, watching the children. You might also see on this campus one of our brave first responders and their child playing outside, or perhaps an Enfield high school teacher who can now afford to live in Enfield while she works, or a young working couple who dream of owning their own home and now are able to save for that home. People living on this campus will be working families earning between forty and $80,000 annually. There have been many comments made, and we want also tonight to clarify some misconceptions about the project. The development will be taxable. Nearby TCB properties generate an average of about $1,000 a year per unit of tax revenue. There will not be hundreds of children on the campus. The number of units, the fact that most of them are, eight, are one bedroom uh, and the others are two bedroom limits the number 
of occupancies in the units and thereby limits the number of children. Again, we estimate between 16 and 53 children on campus in 10 years. There also were concerns expressed that the development would increase costs to the taxpayers. Infrastructure capacity like water, sewer, trash collection, et cetera, is part of a review completed by the Enfieldstown Engineering Department. And if changes to the in in infrastructure are needed, they are incorporated into the plan at a cost to the developer. And all of that has to be approved by the town. And finally, traffic. What you'll see in a moment is that we've added an entrance. We've intentionally separated traffic on the campus to improve traffic flow. We will have eliminated the cut-through road from Post Office Road. And a recent traffic study showed that traffic would not be negatively impacted. So the sisters and their lay partners, they've actually been working and discussing and developing this plan since 2015. And after presenting an initial idea here, feedback sessions have been held with those on the campus, neighbors, community members, and town officials. And this feedback has been integrated into the redesign you're now about to see that Kristen will be sharing with you now. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Uh, thank you, commissioners. My name is Kristen Anderson. I'm the senior project manager for the Community Builders. Uh, I'm going to take my time because I'm trying to answer all the questions that came up at the last meeting. If there's anything I missed, please feel free to ask us during the, the comment period. We're happy to, to take a step back. Um, but one thing I wanted to point out is that uh, we have uh, done a significant amount of outreach around this project, uh, both leading into the last public hearing meeting that we had brought to you and then also since that time. Um, so that includes meeting with town leadership, including the planning department, economic development department, uh, town manager and mayor. Um, and we're bringing forward this proposal today because overall we had uh, received positive feedback and, and felt that this was in a place that it was ready to re-review with you all. We've also had uh, two meetings with the ART, which is the technical planning to, or technical staff uh, that reviews uh, typically more detailed site plans. Um, conversations that we had with them, I know this came up at the last meeting, were things around sort of access, easements, uh, turning radiuses, fire codes. Uh, so I, I just wanted to acknowledge that, you know, at these meetings we've discussed all these different um, sort of needs and, and making sure looking at the plan with those considerations. Uh, we again also received sort of positive comments based on sort of where the plan is now. We did not receive any comments around concerns around increased uh, EMS services that would be needed for the property. But overall, just given where the plans are at this point, the, the feedback was we have to come back once there's plans that are more fully developed. We've also uh, had information sessions where we uh, directly invited abutters of the property um, that are on that abutters list. We sent them direct mailings and hosted a few information center, uh, sessions in the fall. We've uh, spoken with the uh, Commission on Aging and the Enfield Housing Authority to specifically dig into some of the more uh, needs uh, unique to Enfield around senior housing and, and just housing in general for families. We also had two open community meetings that we advertised publicly to talk about this plan leading into this. Um, and of course, have talked multiple times with parents at the Enfield Montessori School, which are on the campus, as well as our advisory committee, which is made up of multiple people in the community. So after all of that feedback, uh, you know, we, we sort of took a new approach and sort of rethought the, the site development, the layout of this project. So the, the sort of first approach that we took was let's think about sort of the land uses on the site. One thing that we heard that was really important was open space and how important that is both to the character of the neighborhood as well as to um, the, the uses of the residents that are there, as well as the school children that are there. Um, and so a big part of this plan is preserving the open space that already exists on the campus. So you'll see this plan encompasses about 70% of the campus is, is preserved open space. Uh, as Bridget pointed out, it preserves about 90% of what is there already. 
We also focused um, significantly on preservation area. One of the pieces of feedback that we heard at the last meeting was really this, uh, this particular zone is meant to repurpose existing buildings, not necessarily uh, be a, a new construction driver. Uh, though that is allowed under the zone. And so really sort of making sure that we're thinking about, okay, what are the key areas of preservation? What are the adaptive reuses? How do we take these properties that are currently not contributing and put them back online for the community? Um, and then there is a smaller new development area, as you can see in the southeast corner, that orange uh, that orange block. I'll say that the uh, building coverage of the site that we're proposing, it's currently at about 7% of the whole site. This plan would, would make it about 10% overall. The other concept that we looked at was the different uses on the site. Uh, so again, really building off of the existing senior uses that are there. In that blue band, uh, that's where the current St. Uh, uh, Francis residents are, which is an elderly 22-unit uh, apartment complex that's already on the campus. And so the proposal that uh, we're putting forward would attempt to, to make that whole band a senior housing band. So converting the convent to senior housing, as well as uh, expanding St. Felix Center, which is currently vacant, into senior housing. We also uh, had a lot of conversations with the Enfield Montessori School and the parents there. And one of the key priorities for this was a full separation of the school uses from the rest of the uses on campus. So you'll see there's uh, now sort of a concentration of where the Enfield Montessori School uh, uh, programming would be on the campus. I just want to add that TCB uh, does have a lot of experience in working with school populations. Uh, so a number of our properties in other communities are built directly adjacent to schools. And through our community life programming, we actually do a number of after school programs and we partner with schools. So we have a lot of experience in working closely with school aged children. Uh, on the other side of it, we've also developed uh, buildings that have commercial spaces, which then end up getting rented out by daycare centers. So directly within our buildings, we have uh, children that are, that are currently going there and getting education. And at the rear of the property would be any of the sort of new construction or non-age restricted housing. So this is the overall updated concept that we're proposing. Just to orient you, and we'll, we'll come back to this and can answer questions as well. The white buildings are all existing buildings on the parcel. The beige buildings are what would be new. Uh, so it consists of an addition onto one of the existing buildings as well as two new buildings. Uh, this is a, a change, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the feedback and it explains sort of what's changed. The dark gray, gray areas are sort of the roadways. Uh, light gray areas are the walking paths um, and sidewalks. And then the green spaces are the open spaces as well as additional landscaping. Oh, and I should just add the yellow line, I'm sorry, it was the historic boundary. So the, these, yeah. Sorry, interrupt, could you, yeah, thank you. So I'm gonna point out a couple of the key changes that were made since the last time that uh, we spoke with you and the feedback that we received. Uh, so one of the key changes uh, based on the feedback was less density, fewer units. So right now the site has about, uh, when you calculate the existing dwelling units there, uh, it's about 5.3 units per acre. We had proposed at the last time we met with you a 13 uh, unit per acre site, which was uh, based on the existing elderly limits of 15 units per acre and the multifamily of 10 units per acre. Uh, but the feedback that we heard was that's, that's really too much for Enfield. It's too much for this particular site. So we've dropped that down to 9.3 units per acre, which ends up being about a, uh, 250 units in total for the whole site, including the units that are already there. Uh, mi minimizing impervious services. I think there was, a, I, I think uh, Commissioner DeGray, you brought up some good comments about being worried about having to put too much parking and then it becomes a sea of asphalt. And so again, really, thinking about sort of the concentration of developments and repurposing the existing buildings to really ensure that we're not having to add unnecessary impervious surfaces. And again, going back to that preservation of open space. Maintaining sight lines from Enfield, uh, one of the key things that we've really heard loud and clear is just a real concern about how this is gonna impact the historic district, understandably so. And so you'll see on that map right there, there's a, a white line going across the center that we're calling the view line, which is about 550 feet back. Any new construction um, 
is, is proposed behind that view line. So what we're trying to demonstrate with this is what you're seeing from Enfield Street are the existing buildings, um, and that uh, you know, sort of behind that 550 foot limit is where any sort of new changes to the site would take place. Uh, we didn't measure it from South Road. We had spoken with the abutters on South Road as well, um, but there's also a significant setback that we're proposing from South Road. Um, the traffic and parking, yeah, the traffic and parking is uh, sort of identified with those orange lines. So uh, a couple things about parking. One is the last time we came to you, we had proposed, I think, 1.1 units per acre. This is increasing that to 1.45 units per acre. Um, and I, I believe we, uh, sorry, spaces per unit. Uh, and we did provide, I think, a breakdown of that calculation for you to, to help get at that. But this is complying with um, sort of the existing elderly parking requirements and the state requirements around um, parking limits. Uh, the other uh, piece that we heard concerns around was uh, traffic flow. So what you'll see is there's three very distinct entrances that we're proposing for this site. Um, the, the front entrance would be primarily for the school. And so this is already sort of occurring and it allows uh, the, the s parents that are dropping off their kids to again get off of South Road and quickly get onto the property. There's a parking lot that they uh, have spaces that will be reserved for them right adjacent to there. So again, minimizing that traffic school flow in the morning. There is a senior housing entrance, which would only go to the senior housing band. So again, you know, seniors are going to have different traffic patterns. There is going to be bus access for the seniors. And so uh, really sort of concentrating their entrances uh, more at the center. And then the rear entrance, it would be for the new housing, non-age restricted housing. And what you'll notice is we're very intentionally trying to prevent, um, you know, sort of people all coming in, going out of the same entrances to disperse that traffic flow. Each of them will have different uh, demand needs in terms of where they're coming in and out. Uh, so this is a, a way that we tried to incorporate that feedback. Uh, the blue spaces on there are the amenities that are being offered. So you'll see the chapel is being preserved. Uh, that will continue to be a place of worship. There is a blue circle above that, uh, which is a labyrinth, which is a big priority for the sisters and um, for the St. Francis residents. We're also um, proposing a uh, wellness center. Uh, this is sort of stemming from conversations about the needs for seniors and being able to um, provide services for the seniors that are there, as well as the sisters who would benefit from this. Thank you. Um, and then there's also some other outdoor amenities, like a gazebo was really important to the seniors on the campus, and then a playground for any um, children that do live in the non-age restricted housing, the family housing. Other amenities include storage, fitness center, um, and we're, there's a, currently a commercial kitchen on the campus that we'd be looking to uh, uh, turn into some sort of a community kitchen. Okay. So there were a number of other areas of concern that we heard but aren't necessarily addressed specifically in the design element that I just wanted to acknowledge and answer questions about. So one, we, we did hear concerns about affordable housing. So one of the things I, I just wanted to uh, emphasize, I, Bridget already touched on it, but the mix of housing is really important here in terms of what type of good community we're trying to build. So the proposed housing would be affordable senior housing as well as uh, uh, housing that's typically designed towards working families. So meaning that there's certain uh, income restrictions that would uh, be designed to really target families earning forty to $80,000 a year. We also heard a lot about how important this property is to the community and just a feeling of sort of loss of that change. So again, ways that we're trying to really help address this, knowing that it is a big change for the community, would be thinking about design measures that are taken to ensure that you know, the preservation feels the same, that the, that the look and the feel of the campus are not changing, um, and that it continues to contribute to the historic district that's there. Um, but also, you know, I think uh, in talking with the sisters more, really understanding that this provides a path forward for the sisters to be able to continue to oversee the property like they have for the last 90 years um, by, by creating a, a sustainable model. The concerns around increase in people, um, there would be an increase from, especially from what it is right now, given the dwindling number of sisters. 
But you know, one thing that we've really tried to look at is what's the existing infrastructure there? What was it built for? And back when the sisters were really um, sort of in their heyday, you know, what was the capacity that was there? We've also had conversations with the WCPCA to really understand what would the impact be on the, the water and sewer. Um, and really, again, focusing on the reuse and repurposing of the existing buildings is the primary focus so that we're building off of the existing infrastructure. There's been questions about the who really owns this and what's the oversight. And so just to clarify, the sisters continue to own the property and continue to have oversight over it. Um, and, and really sort of this model, the question was posed back, like, you know, what is the bottom line? What is really needed? And so to what's being proposed to you is really what allows the sisters to continue to oversee the property and provide the level of service in their ministries, um, this new ministry included, uh, by providing housing moving forward. And then, of course, concern around property management. So, you know, like who's picking up the trash? Like who's making sure people aren't trespassing? Who's doing the snow removal? Who's, who's mowing the lawn? You know, these are the, the key questions that impact all the neighbors as well. Um, and so just to reiterate that the, the scale of this plan allows for full-scale on-site property management services that includes maintenance managers, property managers that oversee the screening of new tenants, um, we also have community life services that are the resident services that provide those extra programming for people who live there. Um, and the org our organization is nationally recognized and does this all over the country. So again, this is just a, a bit of a timeline to show you really what type of scale we're looking at and when this would happen. This really is a long-term vision. I think that's why the sisters started planning this a few years ago and has st have started to bring this together, is that nobody wants to be in a position where you're forced to have to make a change without having the ability to direct what that change is going to be. So this 10-year plan um, includes you know, being here before you tonight, uh, eventually bringing forward, if the zone change is approved, much more detailed site plan uh, site plans to be able to review that have much more feedback from the different uh, town planning departments, and then sort of moving forward with um, beginning the different phase work. At the absolute earliest that anything would happen, it would be 2024. Uh, the primary focus for the first phase would be the St. Felix Center, which is senior housing. And the reason for that is it's been vacant for um, over two years now. And then moving forward every few years, um, we would propose uh, you know, trying to do a second phase. And so there'd be lots of opportunities to have ongoing feedback and communication with the commission moving forward. That's good. Okay. I'm just gonna turn it over now to Carl to talk a little bit more about the zoning. Uh, thank you, Kristen. Again, for the record, Carl Landolina. Um, so I'm sure this is not the time, first time you've been asked to uh, do a zone change. Um, I do know that this district that you hasn't been in effect for very long. Um, my understanding, it's only been used one other time. I could be uh, wrong about that, but the old, the old Blair Manor nursing or skilled uh, nursing facility um, went through this process a year or so ago uh, to change the use of uh, of that from the skilled nursing facility into uh, an apartment type use. Um, one of the things I will just add to the record is that that property was also in a residential zone. Uh, I believe that was an R40 or R. The, uh, the, the field card for the Blair Manor project said R40, and the map says R80, so I was confused or one or the other, but, but it certainly was a residential zone. Um, so this has been done before in a residential zone, and that's why uh, we thought it was appropriate. And, for those of you who weren't here, when we first approached you, before we came with an actual uh, plan, we came to this commission in an or informal way, as you recall, and said, this is what we're thinking about doing into the future. We've gone through your zoning regulations. Which zone, we can do a multifamily zone, we can do this zone, that zone. Uh, what gives us and you the most flexibility? We can create a new zone, which sometimes we do as zoning attorneys. And the consensus was from the commission that the um, special uh, development district was the way to go. So uh, that's why we chose that. So, but as far as any zone change is concerned, you know that you're allowed to do so under your own uh, regulations, as well as the enabling statutes uh, in the Connecticut General Statutes. And um, the one that's uh, 
you most particularly go by is 8.8-2 and 8-3. So um, in terms of what the statute requires, it says such regulations, your zoning regulations and boundaries, and again, I'm just reading from some of my materials and um, you know, and this was all in your packet from two weeks ago. I just decided I'd pull my stuff out to make it easier uh, for you to review. So such regulations and boundaries shall be established, changed, or repealed only by a majority vote of all the members of the Zoning Commission, except as otherwise provided in this chapter. In making its decision, the Commission shall take into consideration the plan of conservation and development prepared pursuant to Section 8-23. So that's one of the things um, you have to do is consider what's in your current plan of conservation development and I'll go through that uh, and point out some areas in the current plan as well as some things which um, I know you've been discussing because it's way past time for you to redo your plan of conservation development and you're working with uh, Don Poland uh, to accomplish that. Um, then if you also go to 8-2, this, what I just read you was from 8-3, talks about, and that's the first sort of underlying section in 8-2 regulation. Such regulations, all right, shall be made in accordance with the, the comprehensive plan, and in adopting such regulations, the commission will consider, again, the plan of conservation and development. So the comprehensive plan, uh, which I'm sure all of you know, but I'll, again, just for the record, is essentially your zoning regulations and your zoning map. So if you're changing a zone, does it, is it consistent, not, or have you considered what's in the plan of conservation and development? And secondarily, um, does it sort of comport with uh, your, your zoning plan, so to speak, which is the regulations and the map, so that uh, someone asking to maybe rezone a property as an industrial use in a residential area probably doesn't fit with the comprehensive plan. Uh, and I'll go through the, uh, the zoning regulations themselves and in, in, uh, to explain why we believe that we do, in fact, uh, comply with the comprehensive plan. Uh, we're going to skip the next one until a little later. Um, but the case law says that in addition, when you consider a zone change and a text amendment, that first you must look at what you're allowed to do under the statutes. 8-2 is your general um, uh, zoning enabling act. All right, so is there something that you, some factor that's stated in 8-2 that ties into what's being proposed? And I would say with respect to our proposal, yes. If you look down at the end of the first page, it says, such regulations shall also encourage development of housing opportunities, including opportunities for multifamily dwellings consistent with soil types, terrain, and infrastructure capacity for all residents of the municipality in the planning region in which the municipality is located. Then if you go to the top of the next page, It says, such regulations shall also promote, promote housing choice and economic diversity in housing, including housing for both low and moderate income households, and shall encourage the development of housing which will meet the housing needs identified in the state's consolidated plan for housing and community development prepared pursuant to 8-37T, and the housing component and other components of the state plan of conservation and development prepared pursuant to 16A26. So that's sort of the framework of, uh, I guess, what your, uh, your role would be in, in determining whether this is an appropriate zone change or not appropriate. So the first thing I'd like to point to actually would be the plan of uh, the comprehensive plan, which is your zoning regulations and your map. So. Um, if you look at the uses that are there on the property now, we've got residential uses, we've got, uh, we've got housing, we've got the, the church, um, and we've got uh, senior housing on the property. Those are the, basically the three components that are there now, and then, of course, the Montessori school. So the four components. Were this project to go forward, that will not change. Those are the components we are going to enhance. There is going to be more senior housing. There's going to be some housing for working families. Uh, the religious use, the chapel is not going to change. Uh, the Montessori school will remain. 
Um, so we think in terms of what's there and what's already presently allowed under your comprehensive plan, i.e. your zoning regulations, uh, we certainly um, can say that we comply with that. So, and you know that the S, uh, this zone is sort of what I would call a floating zone. It doesn't exist on the ground anywhere until it, it's placed uh, by an applicant uh, through this board. So certainly it, it's something that you thought out. Uh, it's sort of a new zoning tool within the last decade to give uh, the commission and uh, landowners, property owners, uh, the right to have some flexibility. This one, I call an adaptive, most of the towns I deal with, we just call it an adaptive reuse regulation, but it's the same thing. What do you do when there's buildings on any pro uh, property that are being underutilized or are vacant? And you know very well that economically, it makes no sense uh, to take care of buildings which are vacant or underutilized. So um, this is the regulation that you put in place to allow any number of uses. You have great flexibility in determining how these uh, buildings would be adapted to different uses. We're not asking for that. We're asking to just enhance what's there and, and continue on with the uses that are there and, 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 and enlarge upon that. Um, so um, I, I think certainly the comprehensive plan component has been met. I looked at your plan of conservation and development, which actually goes back to, I think it's 2006, I believe. But if you look at the housing component, um, yeah. and I looked at the, I'm sorry? 2011. 2011, okay. Good. Well, there were some changes, but the basic plan is, is from 2006. But yes, okay. So if you look at, uh, I provided to you, uh, in the housing section, goal number two, and these are broad goals, and then there are certain policy uh, statements made to how to implement them. So goal number two uh, from this board from 2006 and 2011 is we will become a community of diverse, unique, and unified neighborhoods that preserves, enhances, and strengthens its historic and natural heritage. Could you do us a favor, please identify maybe what page that is in the book? Yeah, you have it? it's 44, uh, yeah, of your POCD. Thank you. Yeah. And that's the 2011 POCD. Right, yes. I didn't want to throw the whole thing in there, just, okay. you know. All right, if you look at the, uh, we already got enough paper in our file. Yeah, it's all right. Um, so, the, you know, and based upon that, you've set forth um, certain policy goals. Number one, to the town of Enfield will pursue a comprehensive strategy to maintain and enhance quality housing. All right. Number one has to do with what you would do in terms of establishing a collaborative or comprehensive program. Uh, number two policy goal, the town of Enfield will encourage a healthy and diverse housing market where housing is affordable and there is access to rental and home ownership opportunities for all including expanding choice of housing and revise the zoning regulations to include multifamily uses. Three, work with public and private housing developers to address the shelter, housing, and service needs of the homeless, poor, and other with special needs, um, so on and so forth. And, and, and you can read on uh, in terms of those sections from the plan. On page 46, Policy 2.4, the town of Enfield will recognize and protect the cultural, architectural, and economic values of his, its historic resources. And certainly I would think that, and probably you'll hear from many people in this room, to say that this campus is one of the, the most unique and uh, historic resources that this town has. And the goal here is to, uh, to continue with that, to improve upon it, um, expand on it a little bit, but nothing that's there now is going to be removed, all right? The, the, all of the buildings there are going to be preserved, and this will allow um, preservation of this campus that exists now into the, uh, to, to, for the next 100 years. Then if you go to page 104 of your present plan of conservation and development. It talks about um, the state's 
long range housing plan and that uh, the, one of the goals of this commission would be to implement uh, uh, some of the things that the, uh, the state's housing plan was looking for and um, that's why the reference in the statutes to the state's plan of conservation and development which we'll touch on in a minute. Now, I know that you are working towards a new POCD, and it's not been approved yet. It's not, you know, I know I've done that a few times, and it's a long and arduous process. And, uh, and, if, and if I may, Attorney, it hasn't even been presented to the rest of the board in some cases. So okay. I would appreciate maybe if we kind of stood away from the working one, if we stayed away from it, because it hasn't even been presented to the other members yet. All right, well, it, it, uh, it's in the record, um, and, you know, so it's there, some of the possible language. And I also included um, some of the slides from a presentation made to you by Mr. Poland, which discusses this very issue. Uh, and, and there's nothing new here in his plan. It wasn't, uh, there's not a lot of secrets there. Your population is aging, all right? Your retail sector is your main driver for economic survival. Your, the, the number of school children in your schools is, be, is decreasing. And the conclusion drawn by Mr. Poland and, and, and many others in his position is that multifamily housing is what you need to look at in the future. And you have done a good job, I will say, um, with that. Uh, one thing, and this is not criticism at all, what a lot of towns like, and if I, you know, I live west of the river, and you know, you drive up and down Route 10, and you see all these uh, new, what we call the luxury apartments that are going for $2,500 a month for a two bedroom, and you have some of them in a section of town, and they're great. They, they serve a need. They certainly do, but um, I really haven't seen anything yet here that services the, the need for the sort of the working family uh, which I think this project will. So I'll, I'll just skip over that, Mr. Chairman, at your request, but the information's Thank there. Thank you very much. Sure. Then the next thing in my presentation is the state's plan of conservation and development, which you are obligated uh, to review in terms of this proposal, uh, first by your own POCD and, and regulations. Now, it says revised draft, okay? And at the end of the only the several pages I gave you is House Joint Resolution number 107, which passed the legislature and became law in May of this year, just a few weeks ago. So now the draft plan, the state POCD, and if you go on the website today, you'll see, you'll still say it, it says, it says draft on it and probably say draft on it for the next five years. I don't know. But that's the plan that was finally approved after yep. probably uh, many years of being in draft form. But you can look at that at your, at your uh, at leisure. And, um, you know, one of the main principles is uh, the manage growth management principle to expand hopper housing opportunities and design choices to accommodate a variety of household types and needs. And then on page 10 of that is some information about the policies of the state to enhance uh, housing, mobility, choice, and so on and so forth across income levels and so on and so forth. So let's, just for the record, um, now we touched on this in our, um, in our presentation. I think Kristen and, and maybe Bridget did as well. But... Um, there have been a number of studies. Uh, uh, Rutgers University did a study. MIT did a, a major study on uh, the effects of multifamily housing. Uh, Rutgers study was uh, hit almost uh, many components um, about how many children you see in different bedroom type units, how many bedrooms, how many children, so on and so forth. And uh, the MIT study uh, studied uh, I forgot the definition or the, how they characterize affordable housing. There's a statutory reference in Connecticut. It might be an 830G application or something like that. 
and they looked at neighborhoods where these types of projects were infilled and over a period of 10 years looked at the impact on the property values of homes in the immediate area and they found that in fact it had no negative impact whatsoever. Um, so that information is here as well and you can look at um, you know, the truth is that building three and four bedroom houses brings children to the town, not building one and two bedrooms. And you can look at from the Rutgers study um, that, uh, that information. So what you heard tonight, 16 to 53, I think, based upon the empirical studies that have been done by major universities, is probably a somewhat high number. Um, but, you know, there's going to be 53 two-bedroom units, and so uh, the decision here was to say uh, most likely, or there could be, you know, up to one ch child in each of those, uh, you know, probably not more, and, and certainly probably less based upon the empirical data. So I also attached in, you know, in, in the uh, file is the entire um, uh, forward thinking report you guys have done every year, the town does, projections for, assume the Board of Education uh, engages, and it sounds like they've engaged the same gentleman for the last 30 or 40 years, and uh, you can read that at your leisure, but it essentially says that your school age population is declining. Um, so, you know, no matter how many children come into this product, there certainly is room. It's not going to overcrowd your schools. In the last uh, page, um, while we were discussing with this board the different opportunities for our, um, you know, what this, this project might look like or how it might be advanced under the zoning regulations, some of the other types of zoning you have, we looked at the differences in density between those types of projects and what we're asking for. So you have a section in your regulation, section 4-43, which is called housing for the elderly. Um, and that's the allowed maximum density is 15 units an acre. You have another section called multifamily housing developments in the MFHD zone, um, and that is the max allowed at 10 units an acre. The other uh, sort of multifamily housing regulation is called the large flexible residential housing zone um, and that's 16 units an acre. So by comparison, we are uh, lower than all of these, but um, certainly much lower than housing for the elderly and the, the capacity or, or density of the large flexible residential housing. So I, I think what we're asking you to do under your regulations is to take a look at this information. I think there's uh, certainly evidence to support this zone change and what's required under your regulations if you were to um, approve this zone change would be during this process to set the maximum density which we'd like set at that 9.3 9 .9 number that's what we're looking for and uh, and then that would allow us to go back and actually we have a pretty good idea of what could fit in it with a 9.3 and where it, where it would go but certainly putting you know pen to paper and actually designing buildings you know we would do that in the future and come back to you and show you that as, as part of the the second part of this review so tonight we're asking for a zone change and for you to set a maximum density so we're here to answer any questions you might have and we thank you for your time Thank you. Thank you. Very nice presentation. Thank you very much. Before we... Sister oh, oh, Nancy, sorry. yep. Sure. Go ahead. I just have... You know, as I mentioned earlier, doing nothing is not a viable option. And doing nothing does not allow us to continue to meet the needs of the present times we live in. Doing nothing on the campus risks overall deterioration of this beautiful campus. The buildings will deteriorate, and nearby property values may be negatively impacted. This project that we are proposing would sustain the campus and increase the viability of the current ministries on the campus. This project would help to meet the current housing needs of the Enfield community. 
and this project would allow the legacy of the Felician presence to live on in the Enfield community and to make Enfield a better place. As one of our sisters wrote, do not fear change. We cannot be afraid of change. We may feel very secure in the pond we are in, but if we never venture out of it, we will never know there is, that there is such a thing as an ocean. Holding on to something that is good for us now may be the very reason why we don't have something better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sure some commissioners have some questions, but I just want to mention one again, unless I'm on a different plant. This is not a site plan review at this point in time, so this is about the zone change and the site plan can change. We might have some you know, particular questions, but again, it's not a site plan review. That was just more of an overview. A lot of those plans can change if, if the zone was grant change was granted. So I just want to remind everybody that. Having said that, is there anyone that has any questions for applicants? Commissioner DeGray. Yeah, I have several questions. Uh, one of them was in your narrative. You're saying that there's a shortage in Enfield of 10,000 housing units. Enfield only has 17 to 18,000 housing units currently, so I don't know where that 10,000 came from. So I'd like that answered. Uh, another thing that you're, and this is to the staff, to the chair, um, the map, the zoning map that you included with this site change showed the whole property going into the special design district. So I'm a little confused. Would the uh, Orrin Thompson mansion still stay mm -hmm. in the historical district if we make this change? Um, another thing as part of the special uh, design district, one of the criteria is that 80% of the buildings, not building, buildings on the property have to be vacant. That's one of our criteria, and that's in 5.60.1C. So I need, I was wondering if we know what the total occupancy is of all of the buildings on that property. Um, and Sister Nancy, said, you know, things change, and we know things change. And there's only 24 sisters currently living on the property, and if things change, um, and in the past we were told at another hearing that, um, you know, the Felician sisters' population ha is dwindling. And yes, you have a 99-year lease, but what happens to the property if within the next 10 years, you just, the Felician sisters do decide to sell the property and the new owner comes in and says, I don't like any of these buildings, we can take them down. Um, that's a concern that I have. So I know you're, you know, you're doing the long term, but, uh, and also would buildings have to, uh, conform to the uh, King Street and Phil Street design district overlay. So those are the, some of my concerns. Uh, so that's it. So if I get answers, you don't need to have them tonight. Yeah, we, don't, we don't need to have the answers tonight. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. Because quite honestly, we, we, you know, be quite frank with everyone, we're going to be leaving this public hearing open. We won't be closing it tonight yet. Absolutely. Right. So. We have some questions. You can get back to us at the next meeting with somebody. And if you know the answers, that's great. If not, we, we can wait till the next meeting. No, it's not an issue. So the one thing I'll say, um, Commissioner DeGray, is that the historic district boundaries, uh, we have no control over them, nor do you. Uh, that's sort of an overlay uh, district. So that will remain until uh, the historic district commission decides otherwise. And so we, and you can see by that map in the yellow line, that's the Orrin Thompson house is, is you know, sort of a car route that was intentional, obviously. I, I understand. Yeah. But in the, the map that we were given yes. in our packet, it, that, that are, doesn't, no, no, I, in our packet, the, the, it shows it as the whole property becomes the design district. That's correct. That's but why I'm concerned. The, yes, the historic district overlay will remain. Okay. We have no intention 
of designing or building anything in that area. And, and since you asked the question, I think it's a great question because staff uh, uh, approached us as well. Should I be using the microphone? I think I have a loud enough voice. But, yeah. you know, yes, please. Yes, please. My parents tell me I, yeah. I was growing up, I had a loud enough voice. But <laughs> so, um, so I had a, a situation very similar to this in, in Suffield, where I represented the Zoning Commission, and had a piece of property that was residential like this, and he decided, for reasons I won't go into, to change the rear of the parcel to an industrial zone and re leave the frontage uh, in a residential zone. So it was zoned in, the land became mm -hmm. two different zones. And, and, the, uh, and that was done without uh, concurrence of the owner, and the appellate court said that that was inappropriate, essentially, to do that. Now, there were some fact-specific instances in Suffield that don't apply here, um, but until I, you know, so my advice to, to my clients was, let's leave it the way it is for now, and if we can figure out some way to carve out and maybe leave it in the RH33 or do something else, we're discussing that. So it's possible that it, that may happen in the future, but for right now, we are proposing that the entire 26 acres be rezoned, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Mr. Holinsky? Yeah, I, I have uh, some questions about the relationship between... I'm oh, sorry, I forgot to turn my mic on. <laughs> um, I had some questions about the relationship between the management company and the Felician sisters. Um, Management company is apparently, according to this proposal, is going to be in charge of managing the buildings, the residents who occupy the buildings, um, you know, acceptance of the residents, so on and so forth. Is that is that true? The Felician sisters will not have any any oversight of that per se, as far as. Um, management, selection, maintenance, all that kind of stuff. So the patients uh, continue to have oversight over the whole property. Community builders will manage the day-to-day -day operations of that site, but there is a partnership between the Felician Sisters and the community builders that ensures how, you know, sort of how the overall site is being managed and how those decisions are made. So for this particular project, the Felician sisters continue to have that. They're the, the owners. They have the sort of final say over the property, but the day-to-day -day operations um, is overseen by the community builders. Um, this is sort of you know what our, our model is in terms of ownership and um, property management. OK. Um, I noticed you manage many properties. Your company is a fairly large company. and. The, comp the properties I've seen are in various areas and very diverse areas as well, okay? Um, uh, where, where would you classify on the spectrum of areas, uh, where would you classify this particular development? I looked at two developments on your website. I looked at Dutch Point in Hartford, <coughs> okay, which has been a long-term uh, low-income type housing development and has been uh, significantly refurbished over the last several years. And I also looked at a, a unit in uh, in Chatham, Mass. Lakeside, I think it's called. It's Lakeview, Lakeview, something like that. And they were, the, the, the difference between the two was significant as far as, one is large apartment buildings, um, you know, inner city type boundary type of thing. The other one, I couldn't tell exactly in Chatham where exactly it was in relation to where, where I know Chatham, but but it seemed to be much more residential, much more open. Okay, um, so you effectively manage both types of properties, correct? Yeah. So when we are developing housing, we're we're developing it to the community that we're in. So you asked, you know, how would we classify this? This this is not Boston. 
right? Like this is not Chicago. This is a suburban community that has a very established um, character and feel in the community. And so, you know, when you're looking at the examples of the types of developments that we've done, you're going to see there's there's a lot of different types yep. of physical structures and buildings. Um, the example we use around here, just because it's the most geographically close and sort of a similar plan, is um, the Northampton uh, State Hospital that was converted into um, a mix of affordable housing, single family homes, cooperative housing. Um, you know, it, within that that community, you're seeing all sorts of building design types that fit with you know the Northampton community, slightly suburban, a little bit urban. In this community, when we when we first proposed the plan, we had much more of um, sort of a suburban model where we were looking at you know smaller buildings, more buildings, but smaller townhouse to try and mirror what was on South Road. The feedback that we got was to to sort of reduce that down and concentrate it. So you'll see in this plan, we're really trying to mirror the existing buildings that are there. One of the design uh, goals that the sisters had brought up early on was really trying to create a continuous um, language of design across the property. And I, I'm sure Miles can speak to this better than I can. Um, but so you'll see in sort of that plan, like trying to respond to that. We haven't gotten into the design specifics, but that will be part of sort of the site plan is really looking at, okay, so how would the future designs in these buildings actually look like they belong on this campus? Okay. And how about um, the application process by the residents and the screening and that type of thing? What what type of things do you do there? Yeah. So as a you know a full suite property management service, um, especially one that we we manage everything from low income housing all the way up to market rate housing. Mm -hmm. What we're talking about here is really sort of workforce housing, really in between mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, every property has a rigorous screening process. So applicants uh, need to apply. They have to go through a background check. They have to go through references. They have to have their um, their incomes verified to make sure that A, you know, not only are they not making too much money to qualify for a unit, but also can afford to live in that unit because you know, our goal is to have stable properties. We want people to be able to live there and to have a life there and build a community there. We also have our resident services program, which is our community life program. So we have on-site staff that are working with uh, community members to make sure that they have access to all sorts of resources. I think the best examples with our senior housing that we provide, uh, our community life managers are working on everything from how to uh, make sure our seniors are not suffering from isolation and that they're engaged with each other. Uh, they have access to health care um, and financial stability and are, are sort of connected to that. So, um, both, sorry, that was a little bit of a tangent, but the screening process, not only are we doing that before an applicant moves in, but there are ongoing inspections that happen on an annual basis. And, and part of that, and, and actually, I think Commissioner DeGray, you brought this up when we first met with you, is this type of um, housing development. There's a lot of regulations. There's a lot of different um, funders that become a part of it. And so there's a lot of oversight that happens. Um, so the way that this housing gets built now is really focused on making sure there's housing stability so that you have long-term residents that are there and ensuring that the community is a, a safe and thriving place. And I think sort of our large, you know, scale of an organization we are and our track record speaks to the fact that we've done that well in communities, which is what allows us to, to sort of continue to, to do this elsewhere. Okay. All right, thank you. <clears throat> no, we have, we, we, have, we have an option at this point. Uh, we do have a lot of residents, I believe, that want to mm -hmm. speak. Do you want to continue to ask the applicants? We can always go back and ask the applicant questions afterwards and the residents speak, or do you want to allow the residents to start speaking? Because it is quarter after nine. No, go ahead. It's, I'm, I'm looking to see for the census. Speak. Mr. Chair, that's your prerogative. I, you think it, I think I would like to get to sure. the point where the applicants can speak, and then I know we're going to have additional questions for you, certainly after the applicants I speak. do have questions, yeah. Yeah, yeah I do, too. I, yeah. I do, too. <laughs> Not highlighted. Yeah. So if that's okay with you, with you. Go sit yes, back please. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> Just give us a couple of minutes, and we're going to start with the uh, applicants who want to comment on the application. Thank you, uh, applicants, for agreeing to do that. do appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lori. As soon as Commissioner Lamo comes back uh, from the um, um, trip you just had to make, we, we will start with the uh, first speaker. Yeah. No, because we haven't adopted it. 
yet. You guys even haven't even seen it. Excuse me, could you please bring the conversations to an end, please? Thank you. I don't mean, don't mean to be rude, but we're going to start with the public comment now. So the first person to uh, sign up to speak is uh, Nikki Price. <laughs> right, you can just identify yourself for the record, your name and address, and I think, I'm pretty sure the mic's probably left on. You might want to drop Is to it? you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. You know, bring it as far as to you okay. best you can. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to state my comments that I prepared, and then I have a commission. I have a question not to be answered, but from your questions yeah, to on. the applicant. I know. Yeah, wait, before we start, I just want to let everybody know you have five minutes to speak, okay. and I will allow, after everyone is done, for you to come up a second time. Okay. 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 Good evening. My name is Nikki Price, and I reside at 1324 Enfield Street. My comments are directed to the zone change application requested by the Felicia Sisters for 1297 Enfield Street. As we meet here tonight, I believe we all can agree the Felicia Sisters have been great stewards of this campus community. However, we cannot allow our admiration to cloud the decision as to the impact this zone change, if approved, will have on the local neighborhood. Let us be clear, we are here because of the dwindling numbers of the sisterhood cannot support the maintenance of the Felician campus. This dilemma was not created by society, rather it's a byproduct of the Catholic Church by not reforming, modernizing the doctrine of religious life to attract young contemporary women to their ministry. It makes one wonder if their enrollment was substantial would this transformation have been proposed. What this zone change will do is to create a steady revenue stream for the Felician Sisters of North America with substantial benefits for them at a tremendous loss not only to the neighboring community but the town as well. The bottom line is the Felician Sisters cannot guarantee 100% the property will be indefinitely in their possession. The Felician Sisters of North America can decide to sell the property at any time in the future. What effect would that have on the rezoned campus and the Felician Sisters partners? How can this commission approve a permanent zone change to a property with such a big unknown? Once the zone change is approved, it is there forever for any future changes to the property by anyone who owns it. Now, as you were asking your questions, um, I brought up their little sheet that they that they have on the website. Now, I'm confused. It says, Felician Sisters of North America continue property in Landover. Then it says the community builders, developer, and building owner. So all those new buildings are going to be owned by community builders, not the Felician Sisters. I think that's a question that the zoning board needs to ask. Thank you for allowing me to my viewpoint, and I appreciate it. No problem. Thank you very much. Ron, Ron Army, I just saw Ron sit down. You could have been standing there, Ron. You're, you're up next. Hi, Ron, uh, Ron Army, 30 Field Road, Enfield, Connecticut. Um, I, I really don't have a dog in the fight, but I am a resident of Enfield, and I was reading the paper, I was concerned about a number of things. 
Uh, the first thing I was concerned about was the taxes. I heard the lady say they were going to pay taxes, but I didn't hear her say how much. Can you tell me how much? No, can't do that, Ron. Ron. Oh, okay. Please. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's all right. Look, all right. We got your question, Ron. All right. All right. That was just... Okay, now, the historic district, I guess, has been covered. Um, and then my other, another concern I have is, and maybe this has been covered, has been the precedent. Uh, you know, they did that. He mentioned that uh, home. So that's perhaps also been uh, covered. Uh, one of the questions I have is this. What is the Enfield community? Does it stop at the town lines? I mean, the, the attorney that was sitting there said that uh, the kids would have a limited effect on the schools. If, in fact, the Enfield community stops at the town lines, the kids will have no effect because these kids are currently living in town. So they just would be living there. Is that a, is that a correct assumption? But he kind of acted like these community, Enfield community, might be any way you can find a resident, which is an entirely different thing. I called the uh, Board of Education today. Educate a kid in Enfield right now is $15,942. That's what they call per pupil cost. So, you know, I, and he'll tell you when a, you know, a, a small house comes to town, it doesn't pay for the kids. And he's right. I'm paying for the kids right now. But at one time, somebody paid for mine. And so I, I was concerned about that. I found that to be a big concern as to where that was. Uh, I was also wondering, you know, hearing everybody talk back and forth, would there be some kind of committee set up so that Enfield does have a dog in the fight? You know, you're talking about she's they're, they're going to check everybody and they're going to make sure that everybody's perfect. But who do you call there when things go bad? Do you call her? She's project manager, but I don't know if she's the one you're going to call when you're getting a complaint. It's going to be like the housing for the elderly down here by uh, JFK, et cetera. You know, you read about this guy's calling, that guy's calling. How soon do you get a return on these people? Uh, everything like that are just things that should really be considered. And, uh, you know, I personally, I would like to see some type of committee set up so that you can, you know, like you do on a board of health, you used to do on this one or that one. Uh, and I think that would be something else. Ron, I'm, I'm sorry, Ron, your five, your five yes, minutes sir, is up. Okay. You can come back if you want. <laughs> no, I... <laughs> That's you, enough talking. You can come back. Thank you. Uh, James Glista. Thank you. I'm James Glista, 19 Post Office Road. Um, I, I'm here with mixed feelings. Um, I was an altar boy in the 50s at the original convent, the old chapel attached to the Thompson, <laughs> the Thompson uh, mansion. And I was there when they opened the beautiful new chapel. And as a matter of fact, I think I had a great, great aunt who was a Felician nun who taught in New Jersey and possibly Pennsylvania. And um, then she retired to Enfield. But anyway. Um, so, um, my statement, I'm commenting to object to the requested change in zoning for 1297 Enfield Street, the Felician Sisters property to a special development district. The SDD zoning, residential retail and office, is too broad a brush to paint over this parcel. Retail and office use would entirely change the scope of this change, which has been presented as residential. If this broad zoning change is approved, there may not be any way to prevent future uses beyond the context of this, <coughs> excuse me, this proposal. 
Um, secondly, my property is located at the southeast corner of the property owned by the Little Sisters of the Poor and occupied by St. Joseph's residents. Since my property is about 525 feet from the boundary of the project, I am 25 feet away from being considered an abutter as are all the houses on Post Office Road between Enfield Street and 991. Yet in this narrative, the applicant is using PTR, precision technologies and storage technologies as examples of nearby uses, even though they are on the east side of I-91. This is very deceptive since the subject property cannot even be seen from them while I can see it from my yard. They also state that there are multifamily dwellings in the area, but I don't believe there are more than two or possibly three. I thought three family, but apparently there's a four family uh, dwellings. Nothing like apartment blocks. This is also deceptive. Um, another problem with the development of this scope is water runoff. I understand there's a wetlands and water course commission that will have their own hearings, but it is, uh, by the change in zoning, you open this kind of development with the additional impermeable surfaces of pavement and roofs, the runoff situation will be devastating. Water already submerges the four or five foot culvert under I-91, and when I inquired about it to a state of Connecticut engineer, she said that the town Enfield has not left anywhere for the water to go with the development along Phoenix Avenue. Another problem is that the retention basin and waterways or ditches along I-91 and Phoenix Avenue are not maintained and choked with cattails and phragmites and are nearly useless. I used to be able to plow a garden behind my house and post office road, but have given up because the tractor gets stuck. Um, the other concern I have is that the Felician Sisters of North America would become a property management business instead of following the educational vocation that they held for decades. Yes, matter of fact, my sister graduated from Our Lady of the Angels Academy and became a physician. So their educational uh, vocation was uh, very, very good. Um, so I would have no objection to having the existing buildings converted to over 55 housing with addition of necessary outbuildings. Uh, therefore, if I am correct, I believe the multifamily housing district zoning designation would be more appropriate. Now, I'm, I don't know all the technicalities of something like this, so uh, I could, so my opinions could be incorrect, uh, but also I'd like to, I noticed this uh, motion to approve PH 3040MA. Um, and it says here, the um, members shall state the reasons for the decision on the record. Findings should be made based on the statements below. Uh, second bullet point is the proposal exhibits compatibility with the character and density of land use abutting the site with similar uses and densities. So I'd like you all to keep that in mind when you're voting. Um, that's all I have. Does anybody want a copy of this? You can uh, leave it with Lori if you don't mind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Glissa. Right. You can leave that with uh, Lori. Copy. Bob Emmerich? Good evening. My name is Bob Emmerich. I live on 16 Post Office Road. And I want to talk a little bit about um, one of the criteria of approving the new zoning, your regulation E. The proposal will provide substantial benefit to the town and immediate neighborhood. I'm not understanding how any of that is going to affect any of anything I'm doing in my neighborhood. It's going to put more more of a problem to my neighborhood than I think anything else. I, uh, <clears throat> I also want to talk about, when I read the first page of the applicant traffic report, and they used that in 2016 volumes from uh, the monastery school, which was done six years ago. Then they calculate de calculated the data forward then redistribute it to different driveways and a property which in mine makes it look like they're not using actual data. Anyone that lives in this area knows the amount of traffic that there is. Now, I've been living there almost 30 years, 
And when I moved into this house, the traffic was mild. This is one of the reasons why I moved into that area. It was one of the quiet areas left in Enfield. And this is what, one of my problems I'm having with what's going on now. And uh, I also want to talk about, they were talking about Enfield Street and uh, South Road. I hear a lot about Enfield Street and South Road. I don't hear anything about Post Office Road. They're keeping the vision away from what's going on for Edfield Street and South Road. But if I'm sitting on my front porch, I'm looking right in their driveway. My driveway almost could slide right into their driveway. I could walk right across. You know, so I'm concerned with what they're doing over there because it is going to have an effect on everybody on Post Office Road. Not just my area, but everybody on Post Office Road. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. John Malinowski. Okay, let's see. Thank you. Hey, John Malinowski, uh, 1302 Bigelow Commons. I'm here to speak in favor of the proposal. I was taught by the Felician Sisters at St. Ed Alberts and graduated in 1967. I'm a 1971 graduate of Enfield High School and a Central Connecticut State University graduate where I majored in English. I enjoy writing and my comments may have a creative theme. At Bigelow, each building is named after a carpet that was manufactured there. My building is named Tapestry. A tapestry is created by weaving colored weft threads through plain warp threads. I'll tie this in soon. The development of the campus will preserve the sisters' legacy and help to continue serving the community. Life is full of change. By permitting the zone change, the sisters can repurpose existing buildings and also create affordable housing. The sisters want to therefore weave a new tapestry on their campus. Although unrelated to this proposal, I can relate many changes that have happened in my lifetime in Enfield. St. Adalbert's was a Catholic grammar school, is now filled with apartments. Enfield High School was updated, modernized, and expanded to create a new uh, centralized and combined high school. The Felician sisters must make changes to the campus to accomplish their goals. Buildings don't last forever, and they will deteriorate if nothing is done. The partnership with the community builders is an honorable partnership. The sisters' legacy and reputation is unquestioned, and the community builders have built successful communities for 50 years. Diversity will be a strength in the new community. Intergenerational residents will come from Enfield and also other towns. This brings opportunity to those who may not be able to find safe and affordable housing. Enfield can be looked to as a leader in this area. Enfield needs to be a welcoming community where our door should be open. So please, let this change happen. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Lorraine Creedon. Hi, I'm Lorraine Creedon, 57 Cottage Road. Um, I have uh, been before the planning and zoning several times. Um, last August, um, I was here to address the accessory, accessory <coughs> dwelling units, which the planning and zoning board opted out of. And um, I didn't have any problems with that, especially as the board said to me, there are large projects coming forward. 
And lo and behold, shortly after that, the Felician Sisters come forward with a large project for affordable housing um, for our seniors and for our young couples in this community. So I am um, hoping that you will indeed approve this change so that they can put these units forward. It's important that our people who have lived here their whole lives, like myself, getting older, if I want to move from my home because I can't take care of it anymore, that I have a nice area to go to, a nice apartment with with a community that's going to care for me like the Felician Sisters. Um, and also young adults need an affordable apartment to get their start. Um, you can't just build $2,000 apartments or where the rent is $2,000 and have young new young people who are coming out of schools in Enfield and have a place to live. So you need them to have a nice place to live so that they will want to stay in our community, raise their children here, and move on to buy single family homes, go to our stores and shop, and pay taxes in our community. I think it's a great idea. I think it's a beautiful campus, and I think it's a great project to have in this town. Thank you. Thank you, Lorraine. Ellen Martin. Ellen Martin, 6 Patricia Circle in Enfield. I travel up Enfield Street on my way to work two or three times a day, two or three times a week. And I started noticing a couple of no vote signs, didn't see anything else associated with it. A couple days later, I see more signs, and then I realized it was probably the Felician Sisters, drove past the Felician Sisters very slowly, and saw the small little subject to public hearing. Um, and I was glad, thank you to the abutters for putting up your signs, because I kind of missed the small one that the town put up. So I want to thank them. The Felician Sisters are looking for a zone change for a special development district. In the town of Enfield, from what I saw on the zoning maps online, and I don't know if the attorney for the other party is correct or not, I only saw two areas that had that designation. Bigelow Carpets and where Bernie's Warehouse used to be off Enfield Street. I didn't know anything about Blair Manor. So there's only two of those areas, and both of those areas are, are business related. That special requirements for the special development district, they have criteria. And I think before you go any farther as a board, as a commission, you need to be able to look at the criteria that is written in our zone regulations to make sure that they will be able to proceed. The sole purpose of a special development district is to enable the rehabilitation of and reuse for vacant, deteriorated, and underutilized buildings and their sites. And they have to have, for that to happen, they have to meet certain criteria. The first one I think they meet, existing buildings containing a gross floor area of 10,000 square feet or more. It has B, enough land acreage of five acres or more. C is what I have question about and that the buildings have a vacancy rate of 80% or more for a continuous period of 24 months immediately preceding the date of application. In all the paperwork that I've seen online, I have seen no information about the vacancy rates, no information whether or not they meet that criterion. So I would ask the board to make sure you get that information in that detail before you proceed because it has to meet all of the following cr criteria according to the town's zoning regs. The uh, substantial inability to develop the project under provisions of any other zoning district. Not too sure about that one because I really haven't looked at all the other zoning districts around. The proposal to provide a substantial benefit to the town and the immediate neighborhoods. Seeing all those signs on Route 5, South Road, and other places in town tells me the answer to that question. The proposal exhibits compatibility with the character and density of land. Now that they've made changes, I'd have to go re-look re at that. 
The proposal maintains compatibility with the zoning districts adjacent to the sites. That I'm not too clear on either, and I'm not too sure. And the proposal is compatible with the town plan of conservation and development. And I don't believe it does, but that's up to the zoning board you to make that determination. I am not sure of it meeting all the criterion, but that would be the place to start to make a determination whether or not you should go ahead and grant this zone change, because once you grant this zone change to that land, that follows the land. And if, God forbid, something happens <coughs> where the sisters have to sell that land at one point or another or within that 99-year span, we're stuck with that designation. So I would ask the zoning board, the one takeaway that I want to leave you with, make sure we're meeting the criteria of the zoning regulations that you're here to enforce. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Vicki Mitchell. Does Stephen want to join you at the same time? Oh, it's up to him. It's your... <laughs> I'll probably just talk over him in that case. <laughs> I'm Vicki Mitchell. This is my husband, Steve. We've lived in Enfield for over 35 years at 7 East Forest Drive. I don't have anything much to say other than, obviously, it's one of the nicest properties in town, as, uh, along with the um, adjacent Little Sisters of the Poor property. A lot of the magazines that I read, and I'm sort of a magazine junkie, where they talk about some of the most desirable towns across the country are towns that have multi-generational developments, where they put children with senior citizens and they each benefit from that relationship. So I think that would be a big plus if that's something we could bring to that area, certainly. Um, I trust the sisters and the development team that they've put together to do a good job, to follow through on everything that they said they're gonna follow through on. I certainly don't think that you can blame the sisters for a declining number of sisters because that is a problem nationwide across all religions. Um, so I don't think that's relevant at all. But um, so I would be in favor of the change as they're suggesting I think it would be nice use of the property. There's a waiting list for the senior housing, so obviously there's a need for more senior housing. We have a son who's 27, college degree, works his butt off, he happens to live in Colorado now, and he's just one of the many people of that generation who cannot afford a decent place to live. And he's making, you know, in that range, like $70,000. He has to pay $1,700 a month in rent and he can't put anything aside to save. So that would be a really good thing for our younger generation to be able to live in affordable housing until they save up and maybe purchase another property somewhere down the line. Thank you. Your turn. <laughs> <laughs> Stevie, if you just, just identify yourself for the record. I, uh, OK. I will. I didn't want to tear the microphone out of the uh, thing. Um, so I, I'm Stephen Mitchell. Uh, I also live at uh, 7 East Forest Drive. Uh, and I just wanted to uh, uh, make a couple of comments uh, tonight. Um, I, I am uh, in favor of, of this zone change. I think it is a well thought out uh, uh, zone change, and, and it will provide a spectrum of housing that, for the town of Enfield. When we moved here in 1983, uh, we were impressed at, in Enfield at the fact that there was housing of a variety of different types, from, from people that could afford smaller units to, to larger houses. And, and that spectrum is still somewhat here, but it is diminishing. Uh, people at the lower end of the spectrum are starting to have difficulties finding a place to live. And, uh, and I think this will help expand and, and look at uh, that, that lower end and focus on that. And I do, uh, as my wife uh, just said, I, I do also trust that the sisters with this plan are going to uh, do this. They're not just in this as a developer is for the money. They're, they are in this to create a viable uh, plan for the town uh, in the future. I also would like to mention I am a professional engineer. 
I have been uh, practicing engineering for 45 years, primarily in land development. And that is, that is what I have been doing throughout uh, Connecticut for a very long time. And this type of development is the way we are seeing things going these days with, with a, a mixture of development that is uh, generational and that can provide uh, an expansive housing. I, I don't, I, I very, very quickly reviewed the traffic information that was provided. It seems to have been done completely correctly according to current standards. Um, somebody mentioned the fact that it was older uh, traffic counts. And, and as many of you know, uh, traffic engineers are having a problem now because of the COVID issues. We are having to go back to pre-COVID counts and project them forward. So that is the standard that is being used today. So that wasn't something that was done incorrectly as was uh, intimated earlier. So with that, I uh, thank you for your time. And I know it's a, a long evening, but I uh, fully support uh, this change in zoning. Thank you. Thank you, Mitchell. Thank you very much. Welcome. Ellie Hamler. Um, Kelly Hemler, 10 Hartford Ave. Um, I am not in favor of the uh, zoning change. Um, a lot of the presentation was really all about the design of what the project was going to be and very little about the zoning change. Um, so that concerns me. Uh, uh, if, if the rehab would just be of the current buildings and put just senior housing, that would be wonderful. Um, but adding more apartment buildings I don't think is consistent with the neighborhood. Um, adding more units is going to add pressure to the current utilities and traffic. And I have a concern that as the project evolves with government grants, that everything could change. And um, so th those are big concerns, and I hope you take that into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Lori <laughs> Longy. Mind if I took a drink of water here while you're talking? Oh no, go ahead. I don't want to be rude. Actually, I am submitting a petition. Um, one of the abutters is away out of town, and they asked um, to. They submitted the petition of the abutters this morning, but this is the 80 additional names that went yeah, along with we, it that they don't count, but they're just saying that they're opposed to it. Sure. And so that is actually not positive feedback. Right. So, so, so we get clear on a petition. We can't consider those as part of the supermajority because the hearing already started. But we'll take those names as people that are posing it, I guess. Yes. And okay. it does say, though, uh, just to clarify, yep. I guess, the state statute does say at or at or before the hearing. It does say that. Just yeah, we were recommended it had to be at the beginning of the hearing, but we'll take those and see what the legal staff says. Yes, that would be great. Just because it, I did attach. Yep, yep. I have book. it too. Okay. All right. So now I can do my part Absolutely. of it. Absolutely. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I was a bit confused tonight because in the procedures for the application of the special development district, it said it must be made in accordance with both the change of zone and a site plan approval. So that was one question that I had when they were talking about this is not about a site plan. Right here in the regulations, it says that they're supposed to be and. So that would be something I would just look at. Um, I sat on this bo zoning board for over eight years, volunteering my time just like you. My father sat on this board in the late 60s and 70s. I really thought this would have come up already, but I know the commission just didn't have time the last time before the application was withdrawn. Um, we just don't apply things from the three main zoning, zoning districts into the other districts of the regulations. There are three districts of regulations, residential, business, and industrial. It's in our book. It's tabbed out. I don't know who came up with this very creative idea to take a section in the business section, 5.60, and just try to use it in the residential district. 
Simply explained, I can't build a mall in the residential district, I can't build a house in the business district, and I can't put a school in the industrial district. We clearly just don't do that. The SDD zone is in the business section of the book, and that's where the tables are for it. There's nothing about the SDD in the residential section of our regulations. It was created for business properties. As far as I knew, it was only used twice for Bigelow Carpet Mills and the old Pace Bernie's Warehouse, both of which were business. It was a very specific that it was in the business zone to use this special design district. The property has to be five acres. There was no mention of this Z SDD zone in either one of the industrial or the residential districts. The table is only in the business zone. I went the other day and I went to look at our regulations book. I went all the way back to the 60s and this is only in the business zone. I think I just heard that you may have gone and done one of these in error. We can't go back in time. However, going forward, we would have to comply with our regulations. And if you did this there where they said Blair Manor, it was not an intensive residential neighborhood like this property is. The big problem is the density of this zone. The density is too intense at 9.3. That's this one. I have something about the historic district and then I'll come back if I'm at my time. Um, if the property is removed from the historic district and becomes the SDD zone, the zone change makes it no longer part of the district because it's considered all one parcel. The entire parcel becomes SDD. So what's stopping the demolishing of all the buildings? Um, basically, once the change is done, you can't go back. It's done. So do something that fits in the current zone that we're in. We don't want them to do nothing. We just want them to do something that fits in the zone. And we don't want a 9.3 density. And then I do have a couple other things, but I don't know how much time I have. 30 seconds. We didn't come back a second time. OK, because this is on traffic. So I'll get to that after. No problem. Thank you. Sure. Tony Spazzarini. Good evening. Anthony Spazzarini, 40 Post Office Road. I'm sorry to have to be here tonight. I have lived in Enfield my whole life and I have lived on Post Office Road for 60 of those years. I served on planning and zoning from the late 60s to the early 70s. There are very distinct zoning sections of the zoning regulations. The three are residential, business, and industrial. It is not the intent of the regulations to be moving things from the different sections into other sections of the regulations. This SDD zone is in the business zone. It is simply not in the residential zone. It can't be used in the residential zone. Aside from the fact that the SDD zone simply doesn't apply to a residential district, the density in our residential zone is 1.25 per acre. The applicant is proposing 9.3 per acre. That is eight times more. How is that a benefit to the immediate neighborhood? How is it that a compatible density for everyone abutting this site. It's not compatible. I'm 83 years old and I don't think I have ever come before this board to oppose anything in this town. This application is not good for our town, it's not good for the neighborhood, it's not good for the sisters, and it's not good for the little sisters property abutting this site next door. I can't believe that this application even got this far. I am here tonight because I am not in favor of this zone change. Thank you. Thank you very much. Steve. I think they want to come together, but Bob and Teresa Crisitelli, you guys want to come together? You don't have to if you don't want. It's up to you. Bob and Teresa Crescitelli. You need to pull the mic Sorry. a little closer. It's okay. It's all right. I 
we live at 1336 Enfield Street. And we are against the new, uh, for it to be rezoned. It will, the change would affect traffic on South Road and Field Street and um, Post Office Road. And those roads will take the brunt of it. The increase in vehicles will not be limited to just passenger cars, but will include delivery vans because, um, because of the population increase, there will be need, need to be more traffic of emergency responders, police, fire, and ambulance. When those services need to be expanded, I see no benefit to the immediate neighborhood or the town. Along with the increase in population in our neighborhood, there will be a higher demand on our aging sewer system. Should, should it fail, how is this a benefit to the immediate neighborhood or town? I am opposed to the zone change. Thank you. And I'm Bob Crescentelli, and what she said. But um, yeah, of a major concern is the fact that this zone change stays with the property. And while we try to get assurances that the Felician sisters will maintain this property, or, or retain this property, I should say, um, there's no one in this building that can guarantee that's going to happen. And if this property is sold, then we have no idea what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. We live directly across it. Right. It's a beautiful property. We'd love to see it stay that way. Um, if the change was to increase senior housing and nothing more, that could be accomplished without a zone change and still be a benefit to the sisters. This feels more like a commercial enterprise than it does uh, something to help the sisters with their ministry. And, and we are both Catholic, so <laughs> okay, okay. we understand what they want to, they want to do good, but I don't think it's a good thing for our town. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. I'm sorry. I'm going to I'm going to butcher this last time. I apologize. Mary Ellen Deluzio. Deluzio. That was perfect. I got lucky. <laughs> I think I need to pull the mic probably closer to you. Hello. Uh, thank you, council members, for this opportunity to speak with you this evening. The presentation by the Felician Sisters. We need your name and address, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Mary Ellen Deluzio, 1330 Enfield Street. Thank you. Uh, the presentation by the Felician Sisters and the Community Builders of Boston was compelling and aimed at tugging at your heartstrings and your interest in providing future housing for our town. I know you will give differing points of view the same consideration. This evening is not about affordable housing and elderly housing. Everyone in this room supports that. This evening's hearing is about whether or not 1297 Elmfield Street is the appropriate location for this high density housing project brought about by a major zoning change. As you know, drastic zoning changes from um, HR 33 to SDD is a serious matter. This application really has nothing to do with my support for the Felician Sisters or the mission of the community builders. I own 1330 Enfield Street along with my sister. I spent most of my first 35 years in Enfield. I attended OLA. My daughter attended the Enfield Montessori School. I willingly and thankfully worked very hard for EMS and to this day fully support the Felician mission. Therefore, my objection to the zoning change is not any personal disagreement with any organization. 
Having invested in our house, which was built in 1773, I love historic districts and consider it our civic duty to protect them. I currently live in a building built in 1880, and my business is located in a building built in 1900. I know full well the dedication it takes to care for these landmarks. I think you do too. It is astonishing to me that a zoning change of this nature would be considered in the historic district of Enfield. This historic area has already been affected by the changes over the last 15 years. I ask you to try and remember the first time you ever saw Enfield Street, or perhaps the first time you stood on the green waiting to participate in a parade. It's a wonderful showpiece for our town, and it has to be protected. It has to be preserved. This proposal does not meet the criteria for SED because it does not exhibit compatibility with the character and density of the abutting properties. Please note, Route 91 provides a major landmark of differentiation between the HR 33 housing and the commercial zoning on the east side of Route 91. The abutting properties are residential, along with the historic Congregational Church and the Old Town Hall. The proposal does not exhibit compatibility with zoning districts adjacent to the site, this being the historic district. This is so obvious. High density zoning will directly affect the quality and integrity of the historic district. The studies presented here tonight by FSI were studies done in eastern Massachusetts, an area that is already very high density and we're not surrounded by a historic district or surrounding a school with young children's age, young age children. And again, the articles and comments from Connecticut towns did not address this type of zoning in a historic district. The zoning change singles out the commuting builders for special treatment in our area and in our town. Those of us who live in the historic district live under strict zoning rules. Why would our neighbors get special treatment? This type of reclassification and the manner of use will disturb the nature of the surrounding neighborhood by constructing buildings not in line with the historic buildings on the campus and the obvious fact that they will be conducting business in a residential area, increased traffic and noise, the SDD will surround a primary school with leased land and multi-residential use and expose the area to high density housing. This is not in line with the comprehensive plan and the historic cultural resource section, which lists as its goal to reduce density in the historic district. How is this in the interest of Enfield? Enfield is a town that has more affordable housing than its neighboring towns. By placing the historical section of Enfield Street abutting an SDD zoning is risk changing one of the most prominent streets in town. As the Enfield zoning book states, your purpose and authority is to promote the general welfare. A drastic zoning train does not protect us or the historic district. I would also note, if I have some extra time, uh, that the people who support this project do not are not property abutters. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Emery. Emery Garini. Gal Oh, see, that's an L. See, I apologize. That's an L. I couldn't tell. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Anne Marie Galdenzi. I live at 1330 Enfield Street, and I would like to thank you for this opportunity to speak to you today about this proposal for a change of zoning at the Felician Sisters at 1297 Enfield Street. A bit of a background. My family has been involved with the Felician Sisters for many years. Since my family moved to Enfield in the mid-60s, I went to OLA Kindergarten. My brother attended Montessori School. My mother was one of the assistants for many years. Um, my sister and I both graduated from OLA High School. Her daughter attended Montessori, and my sister and my brother-in-law were very active and in, in supporting and fundraising for the Montessori School. 
So needless to say, the Felician sisters have been a very positive influence on my life for many years, and I'm a very appreciative of their beliefs and teachings. But I'd like to bring a few points up since I live right across the street from the Felician, this area that's in question. I would like to point out um, to, and bring to your attention that um, the proposal must meet those those um, conditions in the criteria A through H. Under line H, it states, the proposal is compatible with the town's plans of conservation and development. The applicant states that they meet the desired residential use. I'd like to bring to your attention, the proposed zoning change is an increase in the density of residential neighborhood which is a direct conflict with the current plan of conservation, chapter nine of the historic and cultural resource document. Reference page 85 under the Enfield section, that document states, the middle section of Enfield Street is a historic district and most of the plan's recommendations have been addressed. The accomplishment from 1992 to 1998 include reduction of residential zoning densities to maintain the character of the neighbor to neighborhood and to limit traffic. I choose to live in this area as it is a historic section of Enfield containing residential housing that has low density. This proposal is a bu building a different and its own community. This new proposal proposed community does not take, I feel it does not take into consideration the historic community that already exists. The proposed community is completely different from the existing community. Those of us who have chose to live in this area because of what it offers and how it is maintained its historic and feeling and spirit. I feel this multi-generational slash income housing project will directly affect the value of my home and others around it. In addition, those of us already in this area are willing to bear the additional expense for maintaining a historic home or a home in the area. This is part of Enfield, a piece of American history that needs to be protected. We do not get a tax break or any type of consideration for any of the additional expenses occurred to maintain a home in this area. Our presence adds to the town's overall authenticity of its historic nature. Maintaining a historic culture, natural, historic natural um, culture of Enfield Street significantly contributes to the positive culture and architecture of the town. Enfield Street is a Enfield jewel and should be protected. By increasing the density of traffic, it will directly affect the whole town of Enfield. Um, I don't know how much more time I have left. Am I already done? You have about a minute. Um, you can come back a second time if you so desire. Okay, there's one more thing. I, because I do live across the street, I didn't go into detail of the traffic report, but I am greatly affected by the traffic now because of the increase in the Enfield Street School, living on South Road, between South Road, Post Office Road, and now we have and the Woodgate apartment. If there's any kind of event at the school, it's bumper to bumper traffic outside my yard, my, my driveway. Um, during certain times, it's bumper to bumper traffic. And God forbid, if there's an exit, an accident 91, then it's really impossible. So not that I don't believe these traffic reports. I don't, I don't think they really pertain for the done by people that live there all every day. Like I do. Thank you. Thank you. Donna Dubanowski. Hey, everybody. Donna Dubanowski, 23 Betty Road. First, I want to start out that I went to the Senior Center presentation and was asked to sign in. Now, nowhere did the community builders that they, say that they would take that sign-in sheet and use it online. Um, during their presentations. Um, there were also photos taken that evening, and I'm just wondering where those photos are being used. It was very deceiving advertising, if you ask me, but making it um, like, sorry, 
This was very deceiving advertising, making it like those of us who signed in at the Senior Center were for this, and that couldn't be any further from the truth. I can state clearly that I am not for the zone change and not in favor of for this apartment project. I feel that community builders using us Enfield residents in this way is a bad start to any type of community relations. Their entire presentation that night kept, keeps claiming community, but if you look at the number of abutter signatures on the petition, clearly the community is not behind this project. The major reason I'm against it is we're allowing an, uh, in, in Enfield, we're allowing a Boston company, community builders, to come in and compete for Enfield Housing Authority's money. This is direct competition for our Enfield Housing Authority. We, are a t we, as a town, deserve that money to go without any competition directly to our housing authority and not some out-of-town builder. On November 10th, the 2021 Commission of Aging Minutes, community builders was asked about specific HUD programs and HUD tax credits that they would be using for this project. They didn't, they asked if they, what they would be using for this project. They didn't know because there were so many and it's very complicated. It's not complicated at all. You want, you want to know why? Because it's in direct competition with the Enfield Housing Authority. And for that reason alone, it should not move forward. My statement, along with the attachment of the Commission of Aging Minutes for November 10th, 2020, to be respectfully submitted for the record. Thank you. Thank you. Do, do you want to submit? Or, uh, yeah. Is there anyone who hasn't spoken for the first time, or hasn't spoken at all? That, sir? I'll speak from here. I'll no, you can't speak from there. You have to come up. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I can't let you do that. Well, that's okay. Because obviously you didn't read my name earlier on the list, so. Your name's not on the list, sir. I would have read it. Oh, my name is Terry Lynch, and I signed a list that was here on the paper, on the table. Oh, my gosh, you are absolutely right, Mr. Lynch. I know I, I am right, by it. I, I just had to show you how blind I'm and, getting. And that's but, what I say. I talk loud enough, I, usually, so people remember. I do apologize, Mr. Okay. Lynch. It appears right in front of me. Now, I've heard two people before me say they sat where you people are now. I need your address, Mr. Lynch. I'm sorry. 73 the laurels thank you and i heard two people before me say that they sat where you are now i also did that in the early 70s now i'm against this project not because of the felician sisters or any of that i think the felician sisters do a heck of a job i'm looking at two things one is the density, but really it's the change of the whole zone. You're changing part of our historic district into a community development district or whatever the three things are. And I think that's a sad thing for us to do. Secondly, in all their presentations, they have the playground for the Montessori School out on Enfield Street. Now, I don't know whether that fits in our historic district regulations or not, but I know that currently the kids have to play out back, which is wonderful because it keeps them off the street, anywhere from the street. And with kids from Montessori School playing out in front, that opens up, in my mind, a whole safety issue. You have cars that can drive up and down Enfield Street, and you're not you're roughly 50 yards, if that, from the street where the parking lot, where the um, playground went. And you get kids running around, young kids running around, that's not a very big space, and that concerns me a lot. The other thing that concerns me is the traffic on South Road. Now, I know they've said that they're going to block off the driveways out of Post Office Road. We'll see how that works out for everybody. But the traffic on South Road 
is going to be, in particular, at school opening and closing. You have cars lined up at 2.30 in the afternoon to pick up kids out there. You have cars lined up on South Road to get in and out of the front. You have a parking lot that I don't know whether it's going to stay for the school or it's going to be part of the senior citizens that is on South Road that is full at 2.30 in the afternoon with people picking up their kids. What happens to that traffic? It may not impact a whole lot on South Road, but it will impact the traffic in and out at those times of day. And I think that's a concern. But my two reasons for really being in opposition is that the safety issue, I think, is important. And changing that whole thing into that special district is very important because it takes it out of the historic district. And so what else could go there? And that's my concern. But I am opposed to it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And I'm sorry for skipping over you. I apologize. <laughs> And I took a look at the list to make sure I didn't skip over anybody else. I don't think I did. Is there anyone else hasn't spoken for the first time? Please. Hello, I'm Maureen Mullen of 1625 King Street, Enfield. And I wasn't going to be speaking tonight, but a question did come to me beyond many questions I had when I first came this evening, because so many people have covered the issues and all. Um, I've known the Felicians since 1949, when I first went to instructions with them, and they set me off on my path. <laughs> They've always been wonderful, wonderful people, and I thank God that they're in our community today and helping us out. I know it must be very, very difficult for them at this point to struggle with what are we going to do? They have to do something, as Sister Nancy had said. I don't have all the answers. I have a lot of questions. I was um, listening and I was hearing something about the community partners were going to be managing the facilities and renting and all that. And I thought, you know, if the uh, Felicians were in charge of that, I'm sus suspecting that there would be more Enfield residents who would be considered as candidates for the senior housing and perhaps the multi-generational housing. I don't know what's going to happen if that does go to community partners. Maybe someone else can fill me in on that. I think that was all that I have for now. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else who hasn't spoken for the first time that would like to? Seeing none, uh, who would like to speak for the second time? I think Lori was uh, first up. Come on, Lori. Lori Longy, 1427 Enfield Street, and I myself have not been here to speak against anything since I left this board. Um, I would like to t talk a little bit about parking and traffic. I went to one of the informational meetings, but you couldn't see the parking on the screen. Um, you couldn't see it in your master packet. We all know that parking is going to be an issue. We all know that traffic is going to be a problem. They used 0.75 spaces for housing for the elderly, but in residential, you need two parking spots. In age restricted, you need two parking spots. We have our townwide EMS rolling out ambulances day and night from that corner. We have four schools, and it seems like we all know about the traffic, but the applicant wants us to think that this old study is good enough. 
When we had Enfield High School application, we had many hearings. I have a file folder full of minutes from the Enfield High School application because there were so many issues about traffic. Some of you might remember this. When I sat on the board, I was so concerned about the safety of the kids at Enfield High, and I saw the need for a light back then. I had safety concerns then, and I still have them now. Fast forward to today. Everyone is talking about a need for a light because of the increased traffic. I stopped looking at the traffic report after I saw it was a 2016 data brought forward forward and then redistributed. Do you think that this is acceptable? I don't think so. We insisted on counts from the high school in all of the intersections and the streets that were affected by the new high school. We got very different information when we asked for the accidents from the police department versus the state database information. I sat on the board and I remember this. But the statements in the report that took care of that took the cake for me was the fact that they went to the town of Enfield to identify any other pending or approved developments and literally said no developments were identified. Yet, down the road, across the street from the high school, is the Enfield Housing Authority, and it's soon to be renovated. The complex is adding additional housing. No one seems to know about this. Not doing the traffic study while the school is in session and not getting actual data are the types of things that creates doubt and mistrust between the residents and the applicant. What are the actual levels of service of traffic with the current data? But now that school is out, we won't get that information, but it would have been nice to have a traffic report that I would have liked to have read with this information in it. And I will submit the highlighted sections because this is what the traffic report said. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak for a second time? Yes. Mr. Malinowski, correct? Thank you. Uh, John Malinowski, 13 old, big, two big old comments. Sorry, but I'm going to give another emotional appeal. I'll be very brief. We have an opportunity to create the gift of affordable housing and to provide a safe place where people can live. I find it interesting that it is somehow okay for seniors to live on this property but not multi-generational families. Young people are the future of this community. If we attract them to this town, that's a great benefit to Enfield. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else like to speak for a second time? Mary Ellen Deluzio, 1330 Enfield Street. This letter has been requested to be re read by myself and acknowledged in the minutes uh, by the Planning and Zoning Commission in the town of Enfield. Good evening, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. I am opposed to the zone change at 1297 Enfield Street to a special development district from the property's HR status. The revision addition of the Enfield Felician campus by the community builders and the sisters has not changed significantly, significantly in its design plans. A matter of revisiting the language and numbers is nothing but semantics. And they, she refers to the previous proposals. As stated, the final development of this project is contingent on state and local policy and funding that will include the Enfield taxpayer. With a 99 ground, year ground lease and a lot of speculation, it is difficult to quantify this preposterous inflated discourse. The master plan seems to equal 100% with no explanation of how new buildings will look, 
townhouse or duplex, et cetera, elderly units, separate dwellings, or similar to assisted living apartments. The option of may include limited of market rate and unrestricted units. This, in my opinion, is discriminatory. There has been repetition of a term not used in the fall of 2021, intergenerational. Is this by appearance or design? Mixed income means many things, and forty dollars to $80,000 for income-restricted apartments, and these figures are provided by? Mission of redevelopment is to preserve the order of Felician sisters at whose cost? I understand clearly the above segment of their mission, but with great dissatisfaction and the rhetoric every time meetings have been held last minute, and when a disputed point is made, no data can be provided, which disengages collaborative communication. This due diligence and planning and sharing that is emphasized is troublesome. The Felician sisters and the community builders choose to feel only the to feel the only Im people impacted is a small section of South Road, minimal homeowners on Enfield Street, and now Post Office Road. No issues with its new road plan. Neglecting to realize these roads do provide alternative routes for Enfield residents, the traffic study provided is outdated and incomplete, which does not include 2022 data. I have read that there will be no impact regarding the tax base, safety, police department, fire department, town maintenance, or aged infrastructure, EMT services, Enfield Public School System, recreation sewer, supportive services, and the need of other more sensitive services if needed. The philosophical development, operational buildings, parking, traffic, shared spaces, and outdoor spaces are simply stated goals. The short-term objectives are not clear, concise, nor specific, and implementation not mentioned. The impact has not even been clearly defined. There has been no mention that I recall regarding dis dis um, disabled individuals. The residents of Enfield are taxpayers. The Felician Order is not. The TCB is a uh, not-for-profit. There is not an end in sight with the script presented that keeps changing with I's not dotted and T's not crossed. Has this commission even visited a few of the TCB sites? This is very complicated, large development venture, and it is unfortunate the Felician Sisters of North America have not secured and supported their property financially, and now their problem is impacting the town of Enfield to bear the brunt of their failure to do so. It is unfortunate that there are only a few supported events for the town of Enfield mentioned by the Felician Sisters, the Montessori School, St. Francis Residence, and three, use of frontage of Enfield Parade. I do not support this property zone change to an SDD. Sincerely, Sherry Rinaldi. Thank you. Would you mind submitting that to, uh, to Lori, please? Thank you. Anyone else like to speak for a second time? Did he speak for, he didn't speak for first time, did he? I did not sign. Excuse me, you didn't. You, and I did not speak the first time, but I was wondering if I could. I'm looking, yep, I guess I'm looking here. From, no objections from my fellow commissioners. We'll let you speak for the first time. Go ahead. Um, my name is Norman Gagnon. It's uh, 24 Fairfield Road, Enfield, Connecticut. I'm a city of Hartford um, DPW engineer. And um, I want to thank everybody on the board for your service. Um, there's a few things. I, me and my wife take care of the adopt a spot on the corner of uh, Oliver Road and uh, Enfield Street. Um, and uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and I was wondering why we're even here. Um, in the city of Hartford, we, we have a lot of different uh, diversity, a lot of things that we do and we end up doing again. But um, <clears throat> I, the the zone change I don't think uh, needs to be done from uh, you know from what we're talking because I think the sisters have um, the ability to use a heritage clause I think the heritage clause comes into this um, uh, situation where you know they don't have to change the the zoning in that area because they, they, they took on an abandoned building when they, when they moved in. They were there before the basis of the um, zoning in Enfield started. 
So <laughs> they, they're exempt and pretty much grandfathered into whatever they would like to do, and they're here because they want to do things the right way. Enfield, as a community, <laughs> tends to um, uh, choose extinction. Blair Manor, the um, theater downtown, look at the mall, you know. We, we don't reinvent ourselves. I, me and my wife have been here. My wife's been here more than 40 years. I've been here 30 years in the same uh, address. And there's a lot that we miss, that we don't, that we don't do. That, that, that in moving forward uh, as a community, this is a project that should happen. I understand the impact that it's going to have the impact is already there because of the schools that we have. Um, the, the amount of traffic on Infield Street has increased over the last 10 years uh, significantly. South Road, the same thing, you know. But um, like I said, I just wanted to put it out there that the, I don't even know why the sisters are here. They should be able to do what they need to do on their property without a zone change. Thank you. Thank you. I have to take care of one. Um, we have to take, in the middle of this public hearing. We have to take care of one administrative item because we're getting close to the eleven o'clock time. Would someone please entertain a motion that we continue this meeting past eleven o'clock till midnight, please? I move we Com uh, continue the meeting. Commissioner Holinsky made a motion that we continue this meeting past the eleven o'clock time frame, Second. seconded by Commissioner Alimo. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. The records show Lori was unanimous that we are going to extend this meeting past eleven o'clock. Okay, is there anyone else who has would like to speak for the second time? Anyone else? So we're still going to leave this public hearing open because, again, we have questions, as I said before, about the petition and about whether it's going to take four or five people to approve. So this is, this is uh, going to stay open. Would the applicant like to continue with questions tonight, or would you like to wait for the next meeting? It is 1030. I'm going to, we're going to leave it up to you, what you guys would like to do at this point. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, Carl Andalina. I, I think what I would propose, uh, with, um, I haven't really addressed this with my clients, but I, I think probably it's given the hour, um, rather than taking questions from the commission and responding to what the uh, we heard from the public, um, we would probably have no objection to just continue this to your, your next meeting. We're going to continue it no matter what anyway. Right. right. So uh, we're all getting a little tired probably. The only comment I would make is um, having uh, been involved in Enfield for many years. I actually was the first assistant town attorney here in the town of Enfield. And um, sometimes from this level to get to the town attorney's office, there's a few steps that need to sometimes happen along the way. Ginny knows what I'm talking about. So um, I would request that you make a formal request through staff to have the town attorney look at the, uh, the statutes that are in question regarding the, so that there's no, uh, you know, because I've called out there many times and they say, oh, you know, nobody asked us. So <laughs> please ask them. And with that, uh, we're fine for the rest of the evening. Okay. We, I was going to do that, especially the question, Lori, if I may, about the second petition that came in after I actually started the meeting. We certainly know the petition that was here in front of us when we started is needs to be verified, but that's a valid petition. We're not sure that the second one that Ms. Longy gave us um, can be uh, accredited towards that same total because it was given to us after we started the public hearing. Right. So oh. if uh, Jim Talbert could take a look at that, we would appreciate that. We want to make sure we have all the I's uh, dotted and the T's crossed sure. and doing right for everybody, e either course. side. Mm -hmm. Having said that, uh, we have other business to do. I'll entertain a motion to table this until the next uh, meeting, please. So moved. Motion made by Commissioner Higley, seconded by seconded. Commissioner D'Antonio to table. If I may, uh, would you state on the record the date and time of that? Yes. So we don't have to republish a notice? Give us a second. <laughs> I know the time will be seven, but <laughs> I lost track of the Maybe day. Maybe five o'clock next time. <laughs> I know it's the 13th or the, or the 14th. Is 14th, that? 14th, uh, right, right. Okay, yes. that would be your regular day. 14th. Yes. So we're going to table this until approximately 7 p.m. on, you know, after, you know, normal business there on July 14th. 
Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get the the, the uh, motion. Motion made by Commissioner Hi, Higley, me. seconded by Commissioner D'Antonio to Thank table you. this until approximately 7 p.m. on July 14th. Great. All, all those in favor, somebody say aye. Aye. Let the record show is unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We'll give a couple seconds for the room to clear out. Thank you, everybody. We This will be back on again in, in a couple weeks on July 14th. We're taking a quick five-minute recess, Alex. Call the meeting back to order at uh, 10, approximately 1040. Moving on to new business, which is a request for an advisory report pursuant to CGS 8-24 regarding acceptance of a land donation of use for parking to Haswell Institute at 317 Avenue. Would staff like to start this off? I know I... I Knowing everyone in the audience, I can see that we do have some interested participants. I can see them sitting here. Are you, you, and 
Yeah, please come on up. You want to come on up and join us? Go ahead. Yeah, come on up. So, so the um, town council had uh, referred this to planning as an 8 8-30G. Um, I'm sorry, <laughs> wrong wrong reference. 8 8-24 8 referral. Um, so the Hazardville Institute has been um, has been under renovations for some time now, and they really don't have any parking. So we were trying to find a solution to the parking issue, and the Suzex and and the Pfeiffer Halls, I believe, have offered to um, donate some land so we could get to the back property where we already own property to provide a municipal parking lot. And I think. Thank you. If you guys have yeah, you, here, they'll you have have a routine when they identify us, so we know you're sitting here, please. Donna Suzak, 35 South Road. Gretchen Pfeiffer Hall, 4 Summers Road. It's good to see both of you. Thank you. Yeah, we got the referral uh, from the town council, from the uh, uh, from Lori and the staff, and from the uh, town manager. Um, I think there was a question. Did you have a question? Yeah. Ginny? First of all, I think it's a great project, and it's great that you want to donate the land. Lori, I have a question. Well, through the chair, yeah, to Lori, absolutely. I have a question. It's zoned HV33, which means it needs 33,000 square feet of property, correct? Um, they, they are all undersized lots. I know. I They're know, all non-conforming. That's, that's my concern. They have less than 33,000. Right, but they're legally non-conforming. Right, but that would make them more non-conforming if they give up the land. Well, they will. Th this will actually make this lot most similar to the neighboring lots in size. So you're size, saying it's okay for them to take land away from this? I believe yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. That was my concern. So because it's already a non-conforming lot, I mean, I guess yes, it's making it less non-conforming, but it's going to make it. I know. I know. Non-conforming. Non-conforming. More non-conforming. <laughs> sure. Please go ahead. It actually makes it similar to the lots that we are next door to. Um, this lot was particularly long mm -hmm. in its. Yep. Ginny helped us actually when we um, did a change going yep. from um, a business to two residents. She was very helpful at the time. And uh, right now we did submit maps and everything mm -hmm. to the town. And it does actually, the new property line would particularly line up with the next property over, which lines up with all the other ones. So it gives the town a nice I square piece of land. I just didn't want there to be a problem later on. So that's I, why I Absolutely. Asked. Thank you. Is there any other questions? Mr. D'Antonio? Uh, just to clarify, I get that this is for uh, the referral for the land donation. Yes. So yes. The, the parking itself is going to come back to us. Yes. Uh, do we have any estimation on, on time frame for that? Just out of curiosity, when... Let's get, we've been at this for like what, parking twelve years? <laughs> yeah. So it's it's been a process. I mean, the town bought the old um, oil company, and they when Matt Coppler was here fifteen years ago, he foreclosed on the parcel that's to the end of the property that we're we're um, suggesting the donation of. So it has been, I mean, a long. It's a lot of work, too. It's, it's actually longer. We sort of had a, a proposal back when, um, who was in Manchester? Um, Scott, Scott Shanley was the town manager. We approached him way back then with, with, a, with a concept um, to purchase the Connecticut Valley oil property, and there was a sm another small parcel. So it's... it's been going on for yeah, I was a long there. time. Who remembers he was on the council? <laughs> yeah, I remember. It's been a long time. Yes. I mean, we actually rehabilitated yes. the building, yeah. and we but think it looks quite nice. You guys did a nice job. I, I, I'll share, I don't mind me sharing one of my historical stories, Frank. You don't mind, do you? I actually played basketball there upstairs, and we couldn't do jump shots because the roof was too, the ceiling was so low. Everything was all layups. Remember when it was the library? <laughs> no, that I don't remember. I remember Pickett's library, but I don't remember, remember when that was the library. Remember when it was the library? The Hazardville Institute? No, I'm, not, I'm old, but I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I 
<laughs> I don't know, but I had cheerleading practice. Did you? There. Did you? So, yeah. You know, this group is like, you know, this far away from being able to open that building. Yeah. And I think with, you know, other buildings being slated to be torn down, we, we don't want this one to fall into the category where its doors are almost open. Well, you guys have been at this for, for a long time, doing a nice job with the building. I remember, I, I kind of remember when you started, way back when I was on the council, you started before it has come along. I know you're really close. I was hearing some things the other day. We were chatting, so hopefully um, the use of the building will come through. So, because I know you, you, know, you put, guys have put a lot of effort, you're in your group. Uh, for a long time, yeah. a long time. So is there, yep, Frank? Yeah, um, so uh, the referral says 10 Maple Street and the agenda says 317 Hazard. That's the, so that's the Hazardville Institute address. Right. Right, so I want to make sure that, so when we put this on the record, there's no confusion later. Well, 10, 10 North Maple, Maple Street's Street. the land you guys are donating? So North Maple. It, it's no. actually 10 North Maple, okay. but, it but the assessor's record calls it 10 Maple. It, it does right. that for so, everything on North Maple. So I'm just saying, so since there's two different addresses, we'll make sure we get it correct in the minutes and everything. So, so anyone ever looks well, back. The, the address of the Hazardville Institute is 317 Hazard Avenue. Right. The, the current, the property that we're looking to, to donate is, is a portion of 10 North Maple Street. Okay. It's it's the rear portion. So th that's right. So I want to make it clear what we're actually voting on here. So basically, because if we have two different addresses, we just got to be careful. Right. So the basically, land donation is ten is um, well, it says to be used for parking right, at the Hazardville Institute for. at three seventeen. So what are you going to merge? Are you going to merge it after? Is that what they're going to merge the lot or? There's actually no three lots there. Well, so we got two different addresses. I just want to, yeah. it's happened before where I've seen this and we've corrected it just to well, be sure. It's going. It's not going to be a part of 317 it's Hazard be. Avenue. Right. Okay. It's, it's just going to be accessible to right. 317 Hazard Avenue and, and other local businesses. Right. Okay. So the whole village, they're, they're- I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, it's, there is a need for parking. I mean, oh yeah, absolutely. The, no, it's gonna be great. The subway it's, plaza is- Yeah, no, it's gonna be great. That's wonderful. So, it's the referral we're going to be yep. voting for this yes. address on here. Yep. It, and, and basically, it's just a motion right here. The P&Z recommends town council, council accept the donation of land to provide for safe ingress, ingress of town property for development of a village parking lot yep. that could accommodate parking for the Hazardville Institute. If you want, we can also put down t um, Hazardville Village 10 Maple Street. 10 North like. Maple. Yeah. No, they said she said they recognize oh, it as Maple. Oh, is that what is on the card? Right. Oh. That's what the card says. Yeah, but North Maple didn't start until North Street. Oh. Right, it doesn't. Right, you're Way right. Back. Karen's right. Okay, whatever it says on the card, I guess. Okay. You know that. Yeah. Thank you. I didn't know that either. Just full disclosure that there will have to be site plan approvals and possible variances here. I'm, so. I'm sorry, Lauren. Just full disclosure that that ultimately there will be site plan approvals and possible yeah. variances. So. Yeah. No, that's great. Just so down the road, I have to come back again. I know you guys have been working hard on this, do. and just wanted to make sure this was all correct with the address. Thank the, um, you. End of here for the Hazardville Institute um, at 10 Maple Street. No. Isn't there a Maple Street in Thompsonville? AKA. Yeah, also known as North Maple. Okay. Isn't there a Maple Street in Thompsonville? There is, right? We'll do that. North Ma oh, Maple Avenue, okay. okay. Also known as 10 North Maple. Also, also known as 10 North Maple. Okay. So All right. All right, you ready? Uh, the PNZ recommends that the town council accept the donation of land to provide for safe ingress and egress to the town prop property for the development of a village parking lot that can accommodate parking for the uh, Hazardville Institute. And the property is also known as t 10 North Maple Street that's being donated. Okay, does that sound good, everybody? Yep. Okay. Yep. Second. Let's, let's do a roll call, oh. please. Yep. Uh, Lou Fiore. Four. Virginia Higley. Four. Linda DeGray, four. John, um, Frank Limo. Four. Ken Holinsky. Four. Christian D'Antonio. Four. Nick Lefakis. Four. So the motion was made by Secretary Vice Chairman DeGray, and it was seconded by Commissioner Alimo, and then we had a, a vote. You. You we're all set. Thank you very much, everybody. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you.
I've been working on this since I start just after I started. So it's been almost four, four years. <laughs> well, I've been working on it the least amount of time, but <laughs> but almost right, my whole career things. here. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you. All right, now we're on to no old business, other business. Uh, you want to give us an update on a Shaker Heights PH 2868-01, Lori? Due to Public Act 2129, I don't believe that they need to seek an extension. So um, I was on vacation and I didn't get a chance to read the final email from staff, but I believe that was our final decision. Or so you're just going to go ahead? Yeah. Okay. That's com I'm going to put down like completed or whatever. Uh, update on discussion on the where uh, I just I used to say distribution centers. I know you sent it off to Krog. We're going to be all set for a public hearing next meeting. So we should be yes. So we're going to have two public hearings next meeting. Wow. Do we want to do it? Next? Yeah, we need to get it done. Yeah, let's get it done. Uh, it shouldn't take long. Maybe do it first. <laughs> is it? I think people will be in favor of that one. Yeah. <laughs> Can we, if anything, there, they might say they might have comments to make it more strict, but for now, at least we're going to get it on the books. Is there a chance it? that we can do that public hearing before we open? Because this is open, right? That's a new public yeah. hearing. That'll be before we open up this yeah. one. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. That works. That works, right? Yep. That works. Yeah. Um, update. Uh, it's, uh, actually, I got, I got to be honest with you. Um, Lori and I had a little chat the other day about informal discussions with applicants before they file an application. Um, I know it's getting late, but I just want to mention this quickly to me. One of the things that has come up to me over the last week is you know, how careful all of us really have to be with our kind of, Nick's looking at me like, you're right, yeah. <laughs> and, and we are all human and we all do step in it. And come on, it's gonna happen. Come on, we're all human, we're not perfect. We wouldn't be here, right? And one of the things I, I find um, based on talking with a variety of different attorneys, too, it's a common technique that they use. And one of the things I'm concerned of is having informal discussions with applicants so they're feeling us out before they file their application for a text change or something or other. And if we get an informal discussion with them, we could be saying things that then could be turned around. We have to end up recusing ourselves. We had a good example of that, correct? Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of like, I'm not looking for it. just throwing this out on the table. I'm just think about it over the summer. I mean, is that something we want to have staff start doing more and then let them present it to us so we don't ever get caught in that bind? Or do we still want to continue having informal discussions with applicants before they file the application? Are you and, talking and, about meetings? Yes. They come before us. Yes. Right? Again, we can't do anything about the... the the, I thought it was the like good, the grocery no, the store No, the good applicant, the good attorney who, who puts the application in, <laughs> and then, you know, at middle of it says, oh, you know, I think I'm going to pull it out now after they've already gone yeah, through half the yeah. process with it. Yeah. We can't do anything about that. Yeah. So I, I guess I'm just concerned because I'm, you know, because I'm concerned about the body, all of us. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm just thinking, hey, I don't look in, just food for thought for you guys. We didn't even have to discuss it tonight. Yeah. Um, but. I just am concerned about continuing to do more of those. A perfect example is all that discussion we had about the outside storage. Sure. Any yeah. one of us could have walked into that by saying the wrong thing. Well, we even did it with this application we had tonight, the Felicians, before they, before they first came. Yeah, we yeah, yeah, a year ago. Yeah. Right, exactly. So again, just food for thought. But you wanted to talk about this one in particular? Actually, this is um, less, it's, it's it's just really, it's not necessarily an informal request. It's just a request. So they would like to, so if you recall, we were, you approved the Trinity um, remont, uh, the, the new building at Trinity, and you denied them because it doesn't, it's not permitted to have access, a second access on Hazard yes. Avenue, yes. right? Yeah. But they wanted to have that, but they said, okay, you know, we're going to do a tax amendment. We're going to receive that tax amendment application tonight. But what they would like to do is be able to use that as a construction entrance rather than going down Middle Road and, and uh, coming in from the back. Because that was their original right, intent that was the original anyway. Thing. And I, I mean, to me, it makes sense. It's a write-in only. They can't. Uh, you know, but um, they have to get state approval for that too, right? We we just can't grant that. Yeah, they well, have, that's, that's a curb that, cut. 
Yeah. But they need your approval first. They need. So, they want to get our yeah. approval first. I mean, if you need us, need them to come to you, we could do that. But I just felt it was, you know, I, it, it, it's, it's a temporary. So we just, we discussed as a, we discussed we're, we're the body through, middle road. We got to go through the chair. Hold on, and Ginny had her hand first. No, no offense, Frank. Is there a way we can make sure that they get rid of the entrance when they're finished with construction? Yeah. I mean that. I mean that would be if if they're not allowed to have that second entrance yep. based on whether or not this text amendment is approved, then they're going to have to close it. <coughs> Frank for Frank. For no, I, I remember we had some discussion around them using Middle Road for construction. Yes. I think yeah, they were. Right. They kind of suggested it, yeah. didn't they, at first? Or? It's the, yeah. It's in, it's in the zoning regs that you can't use Middle Road as a, as a construction entrance. No, I'm just putting that out no, there. No, I mean, no. We, we discussed Oh, there that. it is. It's in there. I found it by accident afterwards. And what regulation would stop us from saying, is, is there some, something uniquely different with that road that is in the yes, regs? Yes, the oh. neighbors. The neighbors come out in force when, they're, when there's any, right? More, yeah. more NIMBY, huh? Not in my backyard? Oh, mm -hmm. yes. No, I just wanted to raise that. We discussed yes, that option did. with them. And at the, time, at the time, I hadn't seen it, but I found it by accident. And I never said anything to anybody. So, so, does well, so we got, so, you know, so, so they're not, we don't, that's not preferred, so we need to give them. Yeah. This other one. Well, I guess my if I'm if I'm with oh, go ahead. yeah, go ahead. but I guess I'm my, trying to figure this out. I'm not I'm not disagreeing yeah. with Ginny. I'm, no. I'm just saying so Lori can hear me. Yeah. So apparently we have a regulation where years ago the commission wrote that you can't use middle row for construction vehicles. Yep. 5.50.1. You found it, Chris. Oh, thank you. you. Found it. See? Wow, I'm no, where where is it? Is it specifically yes. listed? Yes. Uh, yeah, he specifically just under uh, special requirements pertaining to the BP district uh, oh, yeah, uh, subtitle oh, that's access. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. It says it, it's only uh, permitted for emergency access. Correct. That's that's how right. St. Francis got their Saint back Frank. entrance, yeah. but you notice well, a chain well, on well. it. I thought you. I thought you might have remembered it, Nick. <laughs> so, <laughs> so obviously those have to, to go to the off, state. Right? No, no. Uh, so yeah. So I'll just. So we're kind of stuck. It sounds like they're kind of stuck at this yeah. point. So I think we um, look look at this favorably. It's, we can get them to not use it if they can't use it later. I mean, we well, can't. We well, want to well, make, right. we want to make mean, sure they would, can get in there safely. It would only be used temp as a temporary okay. emergency. Um, uh, construction, construction entrance, entrance. Uh, instead of going through the light and and going through the main yeah. campus yeah. Yeah. with all and, of their trucks. And then before they got their CO, they would just put it back to the way it was. Right, unless th they get approval for it in the meantime, because they're coming in to for a text amendment to allow that area to be used. They're coming. For they're going to come in front of us eventually. Access. Anyways, they want to make a permit. They want to make a per eventually make a permit for their deliveries. Right. Yep. That's what we had discussed. Yep. Well, why they change? The truck yeah. Is there a way we can give it to them without changing the zoning the, regulations? The problem is, is Lori says, well, it'll be a right turn only. Can we make it a very... No. Because you're saying they don't want to stop at the light and then turn in. Well, if it's a right turn, they're having a second entrance. They'd have to stop at the light, then go and turn in. To make a but, right turn only. Right. But the point is, is they don't want to. They don't want to turn into the campus right. at the light because then they're in the middle of the campus. And this people. will be at the very edge of the campus, uh, at, where the construction is occurring. And then we set a precedent. But then again, right? Yeah. We well, set well, a well, precedent. I don't know. They're asking the for a construction entrance, which is often for one person, temporary. Right. Yeah. Or, or should we, or should we go back to the regulation and get rid of that middle road caveat? No. I don't think. No. They, they are, they are coming in with a text amendment to see if they could get, if they could get that approved, then they will come back and modify their site plan to get. That second entrance. To get the second entrance, That's which everybody was in favor of, in, including the the emergency services. Yeah. So. You set a precedent yep. for everybody yep. who walks yep. through. Yep. This yep. is yep. not yep. for yep. a second yep. curb cut. This is for a construction yep. entrance. It still sets a precedent. Yep. How? 
You've because got to have a construction entrance someplace. Right. For every application, there's always a construction entrance. Yeah, so here, here's my question to you. If I might clear my mind. If we were to if we were to vote tonight to temporarily allow them to have that construction entrance mm -hmm. that must be removed at CO time or whatever, mm -hmm. that's no guarantee and no indication that we even have an inclination to change our regulations. Of course. To have them have a second curve. Of course. Because, Absolutely. you know, I'm, I'm trying to think here. Because they are kind of in a jam. They are. They need a construction, and they can't come through that main campus. Believe me, I used to have to go there quite frequently. Um, and we can't. We, we, we thought they could use Middle Road. Remember, we granted them the okay to do that with the Middle Road, and now we find out they can't no, use Middle Road. So they, they, they have a legitimate that. problem. Yes. That our regulation, because of the Middle Road, is stopping them from being able to have a safe and secure construction area and still be able to do business. And that's the thing, safety. You know, it's, it is that, safety. That, I, even I understand where you're coming from. I don't want to say. Can we vote on it? Can we vote on it? Yeah. So, I, I, as, as chairman, I'm going to propose the motion. As chairman, I hate to do that, but since Go I for it. is that we allow, we vote to allow Trinity Health and their construction company to have a temporary right hand entrance into their construction site that will have to be disassembled and vacated when the CO is issued. And in addition, this is no indication that we will accept or have any desire to change our regulations to make that a permanent entrance. So moved. Does that sound right to everybody? Yep. So Fine. Yeah. Is there a motion? I move. Motion made by Commissioner Higley, seconded by Commissioner Lefakis. Secretary, roll call. I hate to do that to you. I think I think that's yes. Laura. Does that sound like we're covered? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Lou Fiore. Four. Four. Virginia Higley. Four. Linda DeGray against. Frank Limo. Four. Ken Holinsky. Four. Christian D'Antonio. Four. Nick Lefakis. Four. The records show that was six of four and one one against. And I, I certainly want to add my own comment at the end of that is that only because there really was any alternative for this particular construction. What are we going to do here? We kind of handcuffed them ourselves in our own regulation. What are we going to do? Well, uh, we're going to approve their application and say, no, you can't get in there. Yeah. Let's just, let's just remember <laughs> when they come back. If you want to make it well, well, that's a different horse of yeah. different color. Yeah. A horse of different yeah. color. A whole different you separate application yeah. or whatever. I mean. All right. Any cool. Yeah. <laughs> You could tell them that an impression is might not be that favorable. <laughs> Possibly. We don't know. They still uh, have to go to the state for this anyway. Yeah, they do yeah. for this. Yeah, they still have well, to go we'll to state the state for this. And by the time they yeah. get approval, the building will be built. Yeah. Exactly. All right, let's and see what the state says. Any correspondence? No. Any commissioner's correspondence? No. Any director of planning report? No. I, I really don't have much. I've been on vacation pretty much no. the last week. <laughs> Any, anything you want to mention about any new applications quickly? And I, yep. you know, yeah. that, that I will do. Receipt of applications. Um, XCA 3041 was our tax amendment. That we, yeah. That's our application yeah. for the warehouse, um, the minimum warehouse sizes. Public hearing 3034, tax amendment also for um, an access drive. This is... <clears throat> The Hazard Avenue and the BP zone. Oh, so they, want, they actually we want to come in front of us next meeting. Yeah. So they should withdraw. It. No, they want to make a permit. They want. Oh, they want to. They're they trying still to want do to come in front of us for a permit. permanent. Oh no. Okay. So they okay. want. To, they want. To, they want and then. To get a permanent second driveway. Right. Yeah. Oh. Trinity Health. Well, the guys who just want. said okay. Right. We said okay for temporary, but they and still temporary. want to make it permanent. They want it permanent. Which everybody seemed to be in favor of at the t during the. So they, and, you know they have the they have the right to request process. a text. They do have a right. So yes, they do. Any chance they're willing to come to the, the following July meeting on that one, Lori? Um, it's well, they're they're, they're going to they're going to be they're going to be at the end. We're not handcuffing them now. They can get started anyway. Yeah. Well, we our action we took tonight gives them the right to get started. So you're right, Frank. You know. I we'll we'll just have to see. I yeah. If you don't mind, somebody yeah, can just give them a call and see because we're you know we're we're. You know, we took the step to. We know, get, we're giving the step to, to get, get them started. going, right. and we're yeah. pretty busy next meeting. And yeah. I mean, they don't need to finalize this for actually what another year. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Until they've finished construction. Yeah. 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 See if they if they're willing okay. to work with us on that. 
September it even be preferable. <laughs> yep. And then um, not no special meetings, Mr. Chair. Oh, none. And then public hearing thirty forty three seventy eight Park Avenue, which is a new duplex. Okay. That's already Park Park Avenue. Avenue. it's already going up, isn't it? Wait, there's already one being built. Yeah, isn't that the? It, oh. Yep. No, that, I think that was 44 where it burned. 73. Was so that, that that's not a zone for multi. I, that's not a zone for multi already. We'd have to come in front of us for that, there's huh? No zone for multi. There's no zone for multi. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. That's across the street. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right. Any no opportunities on resolve issues. I move to adjourn. Motion made by Commissioner Higley, seconded by Commissioner DeGray to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, unanimous. Uh, the meeting is over at 11.05. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex.